Donald Trump was never a man who was dying to settle down. Ivana had other choices, and she chose Donald. Try and blow all the candles out with one breath, OK, honey? He was generating this image of himself as a successful millionaire. You read about him on the front page. He was a big deal. In Atlantic City, Trump, in quick succession, opens Trump Plaza and Trump Castle. OK, now is the time. Donald Trump believed that if he had three casinos, he would dominate the city. He had to borrow $675 million at an interest rate of 14%. Here comes the war of the Trumps. Ivana and the Donald are calling it quits. He was on the front page of the papers for 28 days. I never saw anything like it in my life. Donald's debts are piling up. He was having trouble paying all of his bills. In what could be his final roll of the dice, the Donald went late into the night with creditors who wanted to get their money back. Trump was staring at destroying not only his own legacy, but his father's legacy as well. I covered Trump so closely for a period of time that he was routinely inviting me to fly with him on his plane to Mar-a-Lago fly with him on his plane to Los Angeles. These were long plane rides. He liked to sit and watch movies, and he actually has interesting, eclectic, strange taste in movies. He likes everything from Jean-Claude Van Damme, action flicks, to Citizen Kane. I have money and property. I don't look after the interests of the underprivileged. Maybe somebody else will. And one of his favorite movies is Sunset Boulevard. And he and I watched Sunset Boulevard together with a giant feed bag of potato chips. One of the most memorable moments for me was when William Holden and Gloria Swanson are watching an old silent Norma Desmond movie. She issues a warning to the Hollywood establishment. Those idiot producers, those imbeciles. Haven't they got any eyes? Have they forgotten what a star looks like? I'll show them. I'll be up there again, so help me. Trump stopped and said to me, those are just amazing lines. He loved Norma Desmond's statement about celebrity revenge. And what I took from that was he knew what it was like to be in the public eye, to be a big celebrity. And anyone who thought that he had fallen out of favor would come to regret that later and that he'd be back. Alan Marcus interview, take one, marker. Thanks again, Alan, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Why don't we jump to the time that you started working with him? Because uh, after we uh, sit in oh, silence, yeah, we're going to get some room tone. That's just in silence. Back in the 90s, Donald went through a terrible period of uh, time. The for sale sign is going up at one of Donald Trump's Atlantic City casinos in hopes of reducing the company's $1.7 billion debt. He overbought, he bought the Plaza Hotel, paid too much money. He bought the Trump shuttle, paid too much money. And the casino bankruptcies. His divorce from Havana, his failures in other businesses, he was not the fair-haired boy that he had been uh, when he was building Trump Tower. He was in a, a steady decline, maybe $4 billion of corporate debt. The myth was broken. Newspapers were now going after him instead of just doing press releases on him. Oh, it was very bad. Donald Trump can't come up with enough cash to make a debt. Donald Trump's owed $2 billion. Well, Trump's fragile financial house of cards start to collapse. We were in real trouble. 
we were on the precipice of not being able to make payroll. We ended up borrowing a significant sum of money from his father's estate trust. There was a lot of nervousness and angst and a lot of working with lawyers to protect the trust. And I would walk into Donald's office for one reason or another, he'd be calm. He would never even ask me about it. You had a rough time. Rough. rough. The stress on you must have been. A lot. It's brutal. Yeah. But I've had friends that went through bankrupt and they were wiped out. But the game is over. Some committed suicide. There were suicides. Why does that happen? Why? I think genetically, some people can handle pressure better than others. The one thing I learned about myself uh, is that I have a very unique ability to handle pressure. I was underwater for billions and billions of dollars, and I slept very well. When he says that he's not stressed about it, what he's really saying is that he didn't care. If you're Donald Trump, what you care about most is what people think of you. And maintaining the image of the consummately powerful, always in control man. Donald doesn't care about the facts. He cares about how the facts appear. It's not what they are, it's how they appear. Donald will always say to me, we never use the B word. It was, oh, Trump went bankrupt. I said, I never went fucking bankrupt. I never did it, personal bankruptcy or anything like that. That's another the false. Nobody has ever used the bankruptcy code better than Donald Trump. Donald said there were no bankruptcies. And that was always Donald's interpretation of a prepackaged bankruptcy. But a bankruptcy is a bankruptcy. But Donald knew that he had to show that that was in his past, that he had to talk about his comeback. And so he started by having a book pen trump the art of the comeback. The business book is how to come back from adversity, how to handle adversity, and I think it's something that really people want to read, as you can see by what you're seeing right now. It was the comeback of the year, the comeback of the decade, the comeback of the century. But he had to find new sources of revenue because banks were no longer interested in doing business with Donald Trump. Sometimes you're forced into something by the way nature takes you. And it was the best thing that ever happened to Donald when it was becoming more difficult to finance. The Trump name still had value. You put Trump on a, on, on a building and the resale value of the apartments was actually pretty good and higher. There was a quality attributed to it because Donald made it a quality. Live like Trump, be like Trump, make a comeback like Trump. We were talking once about how many bathrobes get stolen at the casinos, these white terry claws throws. And I jokingly said, well, why don't we sell them? I said, we could put that dumb Trump crest, which it looks like it's 300 years old, but it's about three days old. And sure enough, the Trump crest went on the bathrobes. They were selling them, I think, for $26 a piece. It cost us three. And pr before you knew it, it was Trump soap, and it was Trump this, it was Trump that. There was actually a Trump scent. I was part of the Trump scent team. I remember thinking, does anybody really want to smell like Donald Trump? I fashion myself quite the ad sharper guru expert. This is about the only guy I wouldn't have to tell anything. A big and tasty for just a dollar? I think you'll like it. He, he gets it. He, he is the living embodiment of his brand. The same luxury and comfort I demand in my hotels. Only at Macy's. This is a guy who in some animalistic, intuitive, primal ways, knows how to keep this beast moving and growing in every way, even when it's failing. Can I have the last slice? Actually, you're only entitled to half. He was building a steady stream of revenue through those means, but it wasn't anything huge. So he was casting around for the next big thing. And along came a TV producer named Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett had his incredibly successful franchise with Survivor. And what he saw was reality TV was such a cash cow because it was cheap to produce and also it would keep producing itself. You didn't need scripts. So he hoped to do the same thing with a still cheaper show, The Apprentice. Who will be The Apprentice? Burnett saw Donald Trump as the master salesman who could market anything. When Burnett came up to the tower and described what he had in mind, this show that would showcase everything about Trump, his 
helicopters would be in the show, his hotels would be in the show, his family would be in the show. Suddenly, Donald Trump was quite interested in that. The whole show was an infomercial for Trump. New York, my city. The opening to The Apprentice is something like, we're now in the real jungle. Manhattan is a tough place. Here, you can be top of the world and bottom of the world. Careers are made and broken. If you're not careful, it can chew you up and spit you out. Trump starts The Apprentice when he's on the skids. I was seriously in trouble. I was billions of dollars in debt. But I fought back, and I won big league. Trump says, I've been up, I've been down. But he's not back on top. He's engineering his supposed comeback on the show. Donald Trump needs Mark Burnett every bit as much as Mark Burnett needs him. He's now going to try to trade on a new version of his character, which is that he's a survivor. I'm looking for The Apprentice. There are clouds over the Trump castle here in Atlantic City. Trump was going through one of the worst patches in his career. What The Apprentice brought him was not only the prospect of even greater fame, chance to remake his image, but also a steady income. I had no expectations for The Apprentice, only that I was going to win. Donald Trump was going to host us and select one of us to be his heir apparent. It was just a great narrative for any young entrepreneur. My first memory of Donald Trump is when we were all brought into the boardroom. Hey, Mr. Trump, we'll see you now. You can go in over there. We had to introduce ourselves to him. I read everything I could find on Donald Trump, on his parents, on his grandparents, going back to Germany. I've got genetic pool big time, Mr. Trump, just like you got from your father, Fred Trump, and your mother, Mary Trump. In my research, I found that he is a big fan of the Asian form of greeting. So I bowed. I wanted to win. It was the American dream on TV. The way the show was originally scripted, Donald Trump's role was kind of minimal. He was going to uh, issue the ruling at the very end of the show, and it would be kind of cut and dried. But in that first taping session, Trump kind of went off script. When you're trying to be chosen, you don't interrupt them and say, let me finish. You know, in terms of life, we're talking about life, right, fellas? One of the first times they were filming a firing, he said to one of the contestants, you're fired. You're fired. And the producers of the show called that gesture the Cobra. And it was Donald Cobra-like striking and getting rid of the incompetent contestant. You're fired. Probably two to three episodes in, I started to get a sense of the ratings we were receiving. I started to feel people recognizing me in the street in New York. I started to have people come up to me and do the whole, you're fired, you're fired. It just started to snowball and snowball. Mark Burnett is clearly a genius. His brilliant move was finding Donald Trump to host this. Donald Trump was the only person that could host The Apprentice. Do you think that's true? Absolutely not. Kwame, what do you think? I think one, Amorosa did a great job. But you lost. He did a good job, actually, I think, of kind of picking people apart in the boardroom. People would just kind of start to fold because he would he would prick and pry, and, they, and maybe that was the part that was good for ratings. I think the appeal of The Apprentice is what it offered. Power, money, they wanted that. They wanted to be in the position to say, you're fired. Or they wanted to be recognized by the man who had the power and said, you're somebody who's going to make it in America. You just got to learn to step on people. This quest to work hard, to devise a concept, the best concept wins. It's the embodiment of the American entrepreneurial ideal. It could become really sharky. People could just go after each other. You just had to really watch what you said in the boardroom, and you had to be keenly aware of how others were trying to position you and tell your narrative and make sure that that was connecting with Donald Trump. Sam, you're sort of a disaster. I don't know what's going on. Everyone hates you. I don't think they hate yeah, you. Yeah, pretty Trump. close. Okay, okay. Some hate. So far, you've got no respect from anybody. Would you, you say that's that a right, correct man. statement, Nick? I 
would say that's correct. I think that was one of Trump's great strategies to create chaos and create situations where people would essentially start to tell on each other. You guys think Sam's a leader? No. When we have to all, the rest of the team, tell Sam, calm down. That's not showing the shine of a good leader. You're fired. I have no choice. You're fired, Sam. It was like I had been shot between the eyes. I was devastated. I was the only one who was clueless as to the fact that I was going to be eliminated. I believed that Trump and I had this special connection. A number of the firings really turned out to be nasty, and they really are amazingly devastated. And that makes great dramatic TV. The funniest thing is if you ever watch like the first segment ever of <laughs> Apprentice, it's like, I'm Donald Trump. I own real estate all over the place. My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. I own buildings all over the place. Number one, he wasn't the biggest developer in New York. <laughs> it's, it's all bullshit. He owns shit. He owns nothing. <laughs> Nobody bullshits better than him. The Trump story is the Trump narrative. It's how he sees the story, how he weaves the story, how he decides what the story is going to be, which maybe have no relationship at all to the facts. Whatever his message is, that's what you're going to hear. He's a reality television performer. He pretends to be a successful businessman. That is essential. He looks the part in a televisual sense. He's perfectly coiffed. He's perfectly made up. He's perfectly lit. He's in the high back chair. He looks like a million dollars. And he's acting decisively. All of these tricks of art tell us that he's a rich person, beyond question. You know, always and forever, amen. But in the real world, he's a person with enormous debt. Donald Trump is not a successful businessman any more than the guy who's playing the doctor on General Hospital is actually a doctor. I've been very successful. And people are starting to find out I've been much more successful than people even me. Okay, people are starting to figure it. I'm much richer than people understand. Donald has known for a long time that you can fool people because they want to be fooled. They're lazy. And he got some of that from Roy Cohen, I believe. I think he got some of that from his father. I think he got some of that from his own intuitiveness. Somebody said, but you've had failure. I said, I never had a failure. Because I always turned a failure into a success. It became synonymous with comebacks. It was a comeback. I mean, uh, the Guinness Book of Records said it's the greatest uh, personal comeback of all time. How did it feel for you to shape that image the way you wanted you to? Well, I didn't shape the image. He did. There should be no mistake. Nobody shaped the image. Donald shaped the image. Did I help it along? Yeah. Um, uh, was I complicit in it? Yeah. Uh, but, but the mastermind, the genius, was Donald. One Saturday, Donald asked me to meet him at his apartment in Trump Tower, and we jumped into his Mercedes Maybach and drove from Manhattan out to Bedminster, and I was just firing various questions off about how he felt about himself in life. And one of the questions was, what do you dream about at night most often? And without hesitation, he said, fucking. It's always fucking. <laughs> I used to own a model agency. It was the week of fashion. Uh, we had our model agency party. The security told me Mr. Trump is arriving. Mr. Trump was already considered a celebrity, so of course was a, a, a VIP guest. So I said, Donald, please, I'd like you to sit here with us. And at the same table, there was Melania. Melania was one of my models. In 1998, after his second marriage had broken up, Donald Trump was dating again, and he was out, and he spied Melania Knauss. Melania was really different from uh, many other models. She was very, very professional, very elegant, very classic. She was very diligent about her work. She had a great 
portfolio. We were both at the same party, and uh, that's how we met. I was actually supposed to meet somebody else, and oh. there was this great supermodel. I said, forget about her. Who's the one on the left? And I was more funny. Two weeks later, I did a dinner for the designer, Roberto Cavalli. And they, they arrived together. And I was really shocked. But I, I saw some magic between them. He was proud of his relationship with her. He felt having Melania on his arm offered evidence that he was still sexually robust and sexually attractive and a man about town. You like him right away? It was a great chemistry and energy. We had, uh, you know, great time. He's, we started to talk and, you know, it was something was there right away. Melania is not like so many arm candy uh, trophy wives, if you like, looking all the time to how to promote Melania. Melania has always made sure that Trump feels that he is the focus of her interest. One of her friends said to me, ask not what the Donald can do for you, but what you can do for the Donald. That was going to be the mantra by which she lived. Her role was to be brand enhancement. Donald Trump is on the phone. Hi, Howard. Let me talk to that mom in your bed. What's she wearing? Do you want me to get her? Yeah, yeah, let me talk to her for a second. I think he has always chosen women as ornaments. He's very about aesthetic and beauty. Hello? Hey. Hey. Hi, how are you? You are so hot. Oh, thank you. I see pictures of you, I can't believe it. You're a dream. Oh. I think that Trump always felt that being surrounded by beautiful women was part of the aura he needed to develop. Sorry? Are you in love with Trump? Yeah, we have a great time. You want to marry him? Uh, I'm not answering that. I went to the wedding because a big sort of call out went out to have various media people invited and of course I couldn't resist it, it was at Mar-a-Lago. Was it a fun intimate wedding where you felt in touch with a certain amount of intimacy with a family that was embracing a marriage? No, this was a marketing event and rather a well done one actually. <laughs> it was my first time at Mar-a-Lago. So I've never been to such a fabulous wedding in my life. There was a thousand people, all VIPs, I even met uh, Hillary Clinton. We're so happy for both of you. I know the third time's a charm, and uh, we wish you the very best and much happiness for many years to come. Thank you, and make Thank sure you, you watch The Apprentice tonight, Katie. Oh my God, do you ever quit? <laughs> <laughs> right. At one point, we're in the back of his limo, and he was talking about his wedding, and he sort of randomly shared with me that he was a little bit nervous. And I asked him, well, why? Why are you nervous? And he said, well, you know, it's one of those things. The, the hunt is so enjoyable. But then once you get it, it can end up being a little disappointing once you have it. Do you worry about women and him being attracted to him? No, I don't worry about that at all. You worry about I know, I know who I am. And um, if a man doesn't want to be with me or I don't want to be with a man. Goodbye so, and good luck. That's right. They get married in 2005, and about nine months later, the news breaks that Melania is pregnant. And Mr. and Mrs. Trump, Around the same time, Donald, who's now a television celebrity, is recorded on a hot mic by a correspondent for Access Hollywood. Yeah, that's it, with the gold. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just, I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. There is one event that defines sports entertainment. Welcome to WrestleMania! In 2007, Donald Trump is searching for other venues to help him build his personal brand. And one part of that effort is to suddenly appear in professional wrestling. He had made a study of the ratings for The Apprentice, and he knew that he was especially popular, not on the coasts, but in the heartland. White, middle-class voters, and that's who was coming to WrestleMania. Just as with The Apprentice, WrestleMania was a crucial stepping stone 
Donald Trump's path to the Oval Office. Donald Trump has a pretty long history with professional wrestling. In the 1980s, his properties were hosts for a variety of pay-per-view and major cards for what is now the WWE. When Donald Trump arrives in the WWE in 2007, he is arriving at a point where Vince McMahon has developed a character. Mr. He is the evil boss of the WWE. The fans despise Mr. McMahon. The problem is you need to find someone else who can step in and make Mr. McMahon pay for what he's doing to the fans and to the wrestlers. You laugh at me, huh? You need someone who is popular and famous and wealthy and powerful, and Donald Trump is just perfect. His first appearance, it is supposed to be fan appreciation night, and the visage of Donald J. Trump appears on the Titan Tron, chastising Mr. McMahon. The audience really just doesn't like you. And then money is dropped from the rafters of the arena in Dallas. This is actual currency. Trump will claim it was his money. In reality, this was WWE money that had been earmarked for this event. And all of this is then going to lead up to the point where they decide that they need to resolve this feud that has developed between them. Well, Donald Trump is gonna be in my world, and when you're in my world, I rule. WrestleMania was a perfect venue for Donald Trump. It involved most of the major food groups of his life. It's a game of enormous emotions, of trash talking. Clear lines between winners and losers. The winner gets a trophy, the loser is damaged, destroyed. Trump and Mr. McMahon agree that the loser of the match will have his head shaven after the match. Two billionaires hell-bent on shaving the other bald. This is a long-lived wrestling storyline, a hair versus hair match, a real public humiliation. I have some support from this audience, but 95% of them are idiots. To me, they look like a very smart group of people. These were his people, not the glitzy people of Fifth Avenue, not the social club types who never took him seriously, but the plain, everyday, middle-class Americans. <laughs> Trump believed that he brought to TV a natural ability to connect with people who were less educated, less wealthy, uh, people who were perhaps sneered at by the elites. He saw himself as someone who could break through that wall. Here's a guy, he's a billionaire living in a tower on Fifth Avenue adjacent to the Tiffany's jewelry store. He's meeting middle America and he's bonding with these many different types of people. He can talk to anybody cab drivers, waiters and waitresses, doormen. He's a billionaire who's never lost his queen's roots. The battle between Donald Trump and Vince McMahon was fought by actual wrestlers who did the fight for them. Of course, it's all choreographed and scripted. And as per the method of Donald Trump throughout his life, the fix is in. When order needs to be restored in the match, Donald Trump is going to be outside the ring and deliver a clothesline to Mr. McMahon. Hey, look at that! Trump! Much to Mr. McMahon's consternation, these were legitimate blows that Donald Trump was landing on his head because Donald Trump hadn't quite perfected the technique of fake punches that become sort of second nature to actual professional wrestlers. Oh my God! Trump's guy won, it was Trump who got to cut Vince McMahon's hair off, which he did with great relish. Donald Trump no. actually doing the honors himself. No, Once McMahon has been humiliated with his head shaving, he will flee from the ring. I almost have empathy for Mr. McMahon. 
And then it was time for Stone Cold Steve Austin to be part of the show, and Trump is literally facing off against an actual wrestler. Even though he's down on the ground in a loser position, not a place Donald Trump would ever want himself to be, he has made it with this group. The crowd's sentiments have turned, and they're on the side of the billionaire. These are his people. have a stage persona? I don't think of myself as a performer. You know what I think my big, biggest attribute is? I'm a great builder. I build the grid, whether it's buildings or golf courses or clubs or whatever. I've always said that I build the best product and people get that. He was a living, valuable brand. But his bankruptcies have soured the American banks and lending him any more money. The only major bank that's left in his corner is Deutsche Bank, the biggest bank in Germany. And there's always been this question of why. Why? <laughs> um, I'm not going to answer that. Deutsche Bank, the number one preferred bank by Russian oligarchs for money laundering a bank that has spent over $600 million paying fines for laundering money for Russians in Cyprus, in Germany, and in New York City. Deutsche Bank financed the Trump Tower Hotel in downtown Chicago, the fourth tallest building in America. And this was a beautiful relationship that went wrong in 2008 because there was a financial crisis. Tonight, the growing housing crunch. A huge increase in foreclosures across the country. Trump was due to repay $14 million, and um, he couldn't. Then Trump did something very extraordinary. He sued Deutsche Bank and said that Deutsche Bank had co-created the financial crisis, and Deutsche Bank owed him $3 billion, and he wasn't going to pay anything. And then what happened was really weird. The private wealth management wing of Deutsche Bank, which deals with high net worth individuals, lent money another to $300 million to Donald Trump to pay off his debt to the real estate division that was now refusing to lend any more money to Donald Trump. We've talked to sources inside the bank who say they are bewildered by this, and they find it suspicious. They wonder whether actually the loans to Donald Trump were underwritten by third parties, by external actors, by dot, 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 maybe Russia, maybe Russian state entities today. The story of Donald Trump and Russia was the biggest political story and possibly scandal of, of our era. What do you make of all this Russian money inclusion and everything? Do I think there was flat out collusion? No. But what I do think is is that he would use any advantage he can get. I mean, the big question here is, what is the relationship between Donald Trump and Russia, particularly with regard to business? And when did Trump's love affair with Russia start? Actually, way back. Again, our top story, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev has been removed from power. I lived in the Soviet Union when this was happening. And even two months before, nobody really believed it would happen. When the Soviet Union broke up, there wasn't a lot of time to sort out what property was going to belong to who. It was just very often who was fastest who was the most ruthless. The kinds of people who emerge successfully out of a situation like that 
Those were the people who quickly rose to power in the 1990s, the oligarchs. They become so wealthy so quickly. They literally became millionaires and even billionaires overnight. And so what do you do with that money? You can't just keep it in a bank. Russia is unstable. You have to start looking outside of Russia. And that's exactly what happened. In the 1990s, Trump himself and his team came to realize we are uniquely positioned in the world to profit from this desperate need of oligarchs to get money out of their home country. There's a ton of these increasingly rich Russian mafia and new oligarch-type characters who are in the New York area and are amassing wealth through their connections to the collapsed Soviet Union and, and the corrupt oligarch economy. And he's really pursuing them. You know, he's putting on these Russian music shows at his casinos. He's going around letting it be known that anyone can live in Trump Tower. We won't even ask who you are. We won't ask a single question. Donald Trump offered a very, very special amenity. He allowed you to buy anonymously through shell companies without using your name in all cash purchases. He was one of the very first real estate people to do this. And Trump is not the only guy doing this, but he's certainly the most prominent, the biggest name doing this, and doing this very aggressively. I know the Russians better than anybody. So many apartments to Russians. How many people are going to buy $20 million apartments? It's limited, right. very limited. Market. So I'm sitting back in Russia. He looked to Russia as a source, not in a sinister way. He saw that as market development. And then, like all things Trump, it grows bigger than it was intended. He, he can never say no. He never leaves anything on his plate, and he'll eat off yours. In 2007, Trump was able to strike a deal with an American company owned by former Russians that were gonna build a condominium hotel in New York, down in Soho. During an episode of The Apprentice, Trump held out an internship at the Trump Soho as the prize for one of the show's winners. The other project is in New York City's trendiest neighborhood, Soho. When it's completed in 2008, the Trump Soho, the new $370 million work of art, will be an awe-inspiring masterpiece. In the midst of construction, I get a phone call, and it's from a deep throat, somebody that wouldn't identify themselves. And they started talking to me about a, a young man that was involved with Donald Trump in this project, Trump Soho. His name was Felix Sater. Felix Sater is one of the most interesting guys I've ever met. You can make a half dozen Hollywood movies about him. It turns out that Felix Sater had a record. He had gone to jail for taking a broken margarita class and grounding it into the face of someone in a bar. Uh, he ended up needing about 100 stitches in his face. Felix did some jail time for that. After he got out of jail, he and a group of Italian and Russian mobsters ran an investment scam that took $40 million or so from unsuspecting senior citizens. Pumping up prices of small stocks, then dumping them on unsuspecting investors. By defrauding hundreds of innocent victims. And when they were busted, he worked out a deal where he would become a federal cooperator, and he ratted out others around him. And instead of going to jail, he goes to Bayrock. Bayrock is a real estate company in Trump Tower. Sater, he has this sort of cloud over him. And one day he goes up to Donald Trump's office, says to the receptionist, I have a real estate deal I want to talk to Donald Trump about. And he said within minutes, he's sitting in Donald Trump's office. I basically um, knocked on his door, said, uh, I think we should become partners. I have great real estate deals. I'm going to be a very successful developer, and you want to work with me. It's a very Trumpian move. Um, I don't know. It was, I think it was a very felix -y Did you moment. guys get along? Yes. It was one big happy family. They were going to be doing a string of deals. 
thank you very much to Bayrock. The Trump Soho is a very, very special building. So we're honored by the partnership, and it's always really nice to have my children working on a building with me. As I learned about his background and could document it, I came to realize that everything my anonymous caller was telling me was actually true. I was flabbergasted that Mr. Trump was not careful about who he got into bed with. Bayrock has quite a crew, and they have ties in one way or another to either the KGB or the Russian Mafia. In Bayrock, you see money laundering happening in two ways. It's not just the sale of individual condominiums, but you also see money coming in to finance the actual development from the Russian Mafia as well. I came on Felix Sater before anybody had ever heard of him. And I expected that my story would blow up their relationship, that they would be so embarrassed. You know, what happens to your brand when you become sullied by uh, criminals? But it didn't seem to phase them. In fact, their relationship continued. Bagley's piece was like an earthquake inside Bayrock and the Trump Organization, and there was a lot of scrambling going on. But the Trump Organization wanted to portray Trump Soho as a successful venture. So Ivanka was quoted saying the bulk of the apartments in the building had been sold, when in fact they hadn't been. Lying about that is a real violation. It means that you are conning people out of their money. The Manhattan District Attorney uh, launched a probe, but the Trump Organization made a deal with the condo buyers who had sued that virtually all the money would be returned as long as they didn't cooperate with the Manhattan DA's office. Ultimately, the building's a failure, and it's sold off in auction to another real estate company. I really look at Trump Soho as a transitional project. It opens this new chapter overseas in which Trump and the Trump Organization did a lot of business with a lot of very questionable figures around the world. Selling the Trump name as a brand on a hotel or a residence or an office tower is the chapter we actually know the least about, but it's the most important chapter. People that went to school with him, they don't even know, they never saw him, they don't know who he is. Crazy. There is a meme out there, a narrative that I sold Donald Trump on birtherism. Nobody sells Donald Trump on anything. Nobody knew who the hell he was. He's now our president, he's our president. Donald Trump chooses what he will say and when he will say it. Donald Trump became interested in the question and circumstances of Barack Obama's birth, and he decided to talk about it. Nobody trusts Obama. There's nothing to trust about Obama. If you look at his last few years, everything's a lie. His background is a lie. I mean, there's so much about him that's a lie. It's incredible. Donald always needs a foil. He needs someone to attack, and as you watch his career from the earliest time until now. There is always an adversary. I wouldn't mind forgetting the issue, but I'd like him to show that he has a birth certificate because a certificate of birth, you can get it with a telephone call. There is always somebody that he can punch, call names, vilify, uh, because he thinks that by doing that, he escalates his own persona. Donald Trump has never been afraid to say what he thought. He almost embraces that he's willing to say things that are off limits to most people. I think he thinks that's part of the fascination with him, part of his appeal. I want him to show his birth certificate. 
Wow. There's something okay, on that birth certificate that he doesn't like. Oh, my oh, God. That's a terrible that thing. Is just that's just the worst thing. Telling that he was you. three that pounds and Donna, I love you. Donna, I'm telling you. I love you. you, too. I think that's the biggest pile of dog mess it's I've heard in ages. Well, right? There's something on that birth certificate. Donald Trump isn't the first person, but he is by far the most famous person who launches birtherism attacks and then becomes the most sustained birther in America, holding out on it for years. The fact is that we have not seen his birth certificate. He, I assume, I would hope he has a birth certificate. I'm sure you do. I know I do. It's all very important for one reason. If you're not born in this country, you can't be president. But you've never seen George W. Bush's birth certificate, have you? No, I haven't, but I'm sure he has one. So it's really about calling into question the legitimacy and the validity of America's first black president. I did believe then, as I believe now, that it did reflect a, a very substantial body of thinking on the American right. In a free society, you're allowed to think what you want. It's a page out of the Roy Cohn playbook. The creation of doubt in people's mind. You have people now down Absolutely. there searching, I mean, in Hawaii? Absolutely, and they cannot believe what they're finding. Well, I've been told very recently, Anderson, that the birth certificate is missing. I've been told that it's not there and it doesn't exist. What have they found? Well, it's none of your business right now. We're going to see what happens. Have they found anything? We're going to see what happens. He understands that politics isn't all about issues, isn't always about legislation. A lot of it is cultural. I've had a lot of friends of mine that are very conservative on the conservative side say, ah, skip that issue, Donald. It's not a good issue for you. Skip it. And I say, why is that not a good issue? For a long time, President Obama tried to ignore the birther discussion. They would think it was beneath contempt, certainly beneath the notice of a president of the United States. And just to be clear, I know where my birth certificate is, but a lot of people don't. But it became apparent that this was catching on to such an extent that it needed to be addressed. The White House Correspondents' Dinner is this strange ritual. All of the White House journalists come and they bring usually celebrity guests. And then the president tells a lot of jokes. There were a bunch of people who pitched jokes, but I was one of those people. President Obama was kind of pushing us to like be a little sharper, be a little edgier. And there was this kind of open question of how are we going to address the elephant in the room where the elephant in the room is Donald Trump. This was going right into the heart of the beast. These are the political and media elites who never took his potential candidacy seriously. And therefore, I would not have recommended the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Everyone in the room was waiting for when does Obama get to Trump. That was really the big pregame suspense of the night, and it had been the pregame suspense of the night at that point for weeks. My fellow Americans. He started making jokes about Donald Trump. No one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. <laughs> and the crowd started laughing more and more. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? And where are Biggie and Tupac? <laughs> I was sitting behind Trump that evening, and I watched his neck go from pale shrimp to deep beetroot as he listened to Obama very wittily and coolly making fun of him. He was relentless. What you had was this kind of sea of laughter and then this just pure island of rage in the middle of it. It was the night of Barack Obama's revenge. Donald Trump wanted to be taken seriously and this was an effort by the president and to a certain degree I think the Washington establishment to say hey look New York and tabloids are one thing this is the big leagues go back home Donald Trump left the White House correspondence dinner early I don't think he decided in the car that he was going to run for president and win I think he decided 
as he rose from his seat. And I sort of imagined in the back of his mind it was like Norma Desmond. Those imbeciles. Haven't they got any eyes? Have they forgotten what a star looks like? Do they think I'm a has-been? I'll show them. I'll be up there again, so help me. I'll show them what a star is. You remember the famous interview when uh, Obama was asked, Donald Trump says you're the worst president in American history. What's your reaction? At least I will go down as a president. Who got the last laugh on that one? So you are running for the Republican nomination. Yes. If you run, okay, you, right. you described yourself politically as a conservative. I am a very conservative person. Very conservative person. But with a big heart. I like to say said, I'm conservative with a big heart. He was always amused by those in the mainstream media who kept insisting that running for president it was all a publicity stunt to burnish the Trump brand, uh, that he's never really going to run. Well, I think I have a lot of experience, more than most people, and certainly more than most candidates. In 2012, I think he came very, very close to running. But he ultimately decided not to make that race, I think largely based on the fact that uh, Obama was an incumbent. President Obama to congratulate him on his victory. I think that Donald Trump was very disappointed when Mitt Romney lost. I think he immediately regretted not running himself. God bless the United States. He did tell me that right after the election, he had trademarked the phrase, make America great again. To me, this was a sign of his seriousness. I gave an interview very early in which I said in an offhanded manner, well, I thought he should run in 2016 because it would probably be his last chance given his age. Boy, he chewed my ass about that. I'm Donald Trump, and this is the most important pageant in the world. And I should know because I own it. Donald Trump had always loved the idea of beauty pageants in his Atlantic City days, running the casinos. In 1996, along came an opportunity to buy the Miss Universe pageant. A better match could not have been made. He was very excited that he had a business that would keep him in touch with very young women. He had felt the pageants had started to emphasize women's minds and abilities too much. And what he said to me is, nobody wants to watch one of these things and see a girl playing a violin. They just want to know what she looks like. He wanted to get it back to his roots. Donald Trump saw in the ability to own the Miss Universe pageant not only a chance to hang out backstage, but also this was a way for Donald Trump to get the Trump name and brand spread to many more countries. I have a name that's the hottest name in the world. Going, I'm doing deals, I'm buying this one, I'm buying that one. They really want Trump, because Trump is a hot name. It's the hottest name in the world. Donald Trump was an empire builder. He was a thousand percent committed to the accumulation of wealth and power. And this was the lesson that he was taught as a child. You never stop pushing, you never stop building. At that time, the Trump Organization is doing business with players in countries all over the world. Trump comes up with this new model that it's almost amazing it took him so long to find it, because it's so perfect for who he is. This model of just selling his name and putting his name on a project. And Trump always had a group of would-be deal makers around him. These often were people with shady past. Donald Trump ended up in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, where he had business connections with another billionaire developer, a guy named Anar Mamadov. The Mamadov family was seen as unbelievably corrupt, I and mean, corrupt even for Azerbaijan, which is a very corrupt country. They were in business with a company that was 
almost without question, nothing more than a front for Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard, which had created a global financial network to fund terrorism, to acquire weapons of mass destruction. True bad actors. Anyone who's done business with Donald Trump knows that all you have to do is walk into the office with a bag of cash and drop it on his desk, and he'll do business with you. If the money's there, he'll go for it. And he doesn't do due diligence. In June of 2013, Trump announced that he was going to hold the Miss Universe contest in Moscow. And really, we wanted Moscow all the way. And part of the reason we wanted is one of the great families in Russia is our partner in this endeavor. He's paid by a Russian oligarch, Aras Agalarov, to bring this contest to Moscow. It's lucrative. <laughs> It's going to be amazing. Aris Agalarov was a builder. He was known as Putin's builder because he had built so many projects for Putin and the Russian state. The Agalarovs are a huge step up for Trump. He had been in this frenzy from 2010, 11, 12, just doing business with a whole bunch of characters all over the former Soviet Union. But these are third tier characters in third tier countries. And Moscow is a huge step up. Moscow was, by 2013, one of the most expensive cities in the world. And Moscow real estate had become this hot, hot market. If you talk to people in the Miss Universe organization, they will tell you that holding the contest in Moscow was really not the prime objective. It was to open a pathway to building a Trump Tower in Moscow. Trump gets obsessed with Russia and clearly sees it as a place where he's going to make a mark, make a fortune, where he's going to be a major player. For Trump, having a Trump Tower in Moscow, I think, would have been the jewel on the crown. Trump flies to Moscow, November 8th, 2013. He gets there in the middle of the day or so, and he is the arriving champion. The Miss Universe is the biggest thing going on. We're very happy that Moscow and all of Russia is going well. Now, at this point in time, Trump is obsessed with really one thing. He's obsessed with Vladimir Putin. As soon as Trump announces that he's going to hold Miss Universe in Moscow, he's tweeting out, will Vladimir Putin come to the event? Will he be my new best friend? Meanwhile, Putin's already widely regarded around the world as a thug. He's repressed dissent in Russia. There have been massive human rights abuses in Chechnya. Russian forces need to leave Georgia at once. If anyone thinks that, that they can say. come and kill us, they should think what consequences such a policy will have for them. Journalists and critics of the Russian state have been killed. But Trump is enamored with him. Trump, rather nakedly and openly, has been courting Putin's favor for many years, eagerly hoping to have a relationship with Putin and to have business in Moscow. Trump Tower in Moscow was this kind of elusive thing Trump's been trying to build for three decades unsuccessfully. We know that real estate developer Trump really cares about status. Having the tallest building and then your name on top of that tallest building is like the symbol to show off how successful you are, how rich you are. Trump is basically auditioning. He comes to Moscow hat in hand. I called it my weekend in Moscow, but I was with the top level people, both oligarchs and generals and top of the government people. I can't go further than that, but I will tell you that I met the top people. The heart of the matter is whether or not that trip 
And what happened during that trip involved activities or business deals that gave the Kremlin leverage over him. First day, there's a lunch held for Trump at Nobu. This is the famous sushi restaurant. And there are a bunch of Russian businessmen there, bankers. Later, Trump says, all the oligarchs were there. I got to meet all of the leaders. I got to meet all, I mean, everybody was there. After the lunch, he goes to the theater where they're doing the final run through for the Miss Universe pageant, which is gonna be the next day. And that night, there was a birthday party for Aris Ergalerov. And around 1 a.m., Donald Trump went back to the Ritz Carlton Hotel in downtown Moscow, where Trump was staying. Keith Schiller, who was Trump's bodyguard, says that Trump went into his room alone and that he stood guard there for a little while and then left. There, of course, is a question, but what happened in his hotel room the one night he stayed in the Russian capital? The hotel where Trump stayed is known to be completely bugged by the FSB, that basically everything you do there is watched. The FSB, the, the, the spy agency which Vladimir Putin once headed, films people inside their, their, their flats, in their bedrooms, I know from personal experience, when I was in Moscow with my wife and two small kids, for three and a half years, we were watched. And the FSB let us know this, because on one occasion, uh, I came back from a family holiday in Berlin to discover that the FSB had left a little present by the side of the marital bed. A sex manual in Russian, which they had bookmarked to a page on orgasms. I mean, in essence, they were saying, we're watching you having sex. And the Russians collect this information. It's called Kompromat, and they use it all the time. Kompromat is um, an old term from uh, the Soviet era uh, that basically means compromising material or blackmail. They will have videoed Donald Trump, for sure, and those, those tapes will still exist. Earlier in the day, someone came up to Keith Schiller and said, would Mr. Trump like five women in his room tonight? And Keith Schiller says that he told this person, we don't do that. And that was that. If you're thinking about 2013 and the Miss Universe beauty pageant, you have to ask yourself this question. Did Donald Trump go to bed early with a cup of hot chocolate and a 19th century novel? Or did Donald Trump have a more exciting and exotic time? I'll let you decide. The story next picks up early, early the next morning. He had been asked to do a cameo appearance in a video that was being shot for the son of Eris Ergolarov, Emin Ergolarov. Emin is a pop star, well, let's say of modest repute. He actually makes this pop music video with lots of contestants from Miss Universe. When Trump has taken a license from him, and so he appears at that video shoot. Emin, wake up. Come on, you're fired. The rest of the day, he has lots of interviews and press conferences. We're thinking about doing a Trump Tower in Moscow, so we're talking to a group of people about doing that. It was announced that he and Ergolarov were proceeding with a project. Now Trump has a partner that can help him cut through the red tape, that has a good relationship with Putin. So the deal finally starts to move. Uh, Donald, do you have a relationship with Vladimir Putin? I do have a relationship, and I can tell you that he's very interested in what we're doing here today. He's probably very interested in what you and I are saying today. At one interview, he praises Putin. I think that uh, Putin has done an amazing job of showing certain leadership that our people have not been able to match. He says Putin's watching very closely what we're doing here. You know, almost implying that Putin's gonna come. And he wants Putin to come. He 
asks the people around him over and over and over again, is Putin coming? Will I be meeting with Putin? Will I see him? Can I see him? Can I see him? This is the moment. They say, we're waiting, and he gets anxious and anxious and anxious about this. So this year, 2013 is Venezuela, Gabriela Isla! Finally, the phone rings, and it's Dmitry Peskov, who is Putin's chief spokesman strategist, and he says, I'm sorry, the president can't see you. His schedule won't permit it. Trump, of course, is disappointed. And at one point, he says to one of the Miss Universe officials, you know, we could tell people that Putin came. No one would know the difference. So after the Miss Universe pageant wraps up in Moscow in the fall of 2013, there's a memorandum of understanding that is drafted between the Trump Organization and the Aguilarov Corporation, which is Trump Tower in Moscow. And the deal starts to actually move. But then Russia invades Ukraine and annexes Crimea, and then immediately sanctions hit and the sanctions killed the deal. Based on the executive order that I signed in response to Russia's initial intervention in Ukraine, we're imposing sanctions on more senior officials of the Russian government. From Trump's mind at the time, I can imagine this being a key moment where he sees Obama trying to kill his dream deal that he's been working for for now decades. A few weeks after the Miss Universe contest was over, a woman shows up at the Miss Universe office in New York City. It's the daughter of Eris Aguilera. She has a gift to Donald Trump. Putin didn't or wouldn't make time to see Donald Trump, but he did arrange for Trump to be given a gift. This is a black lacquer box. The box is delivered to Trump at Trump Tower. Inside the box, there is an envelope. And to this day, no one knows, at least no one in the public knows, what was in that note. It might have just been, sorry I missed you. It might have been something more. But my guess is that whatever it was, it was an indication that Putin knows how to play Donald Trump. Please welcome Donald Trump. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I saw the other day on television, people just walking across the board. They're walking. The military's standing there holding guns, and people just walking right in front, coming into our country. It's January 2015, and some of the people on Trump's staff, including a guy named Sam Nunberg, really believed in the power of illegal immigration to galvanize Republican voters. But the problem they had is they couldn't keep Trump on message. He would get up before these conservative groups, and, and he would wander. And so Nunberg came up with this idea. He told Trump, you ought to go out there and tell them that you're going to build a wall to stop illegal immigrants from coming into this country. And you know, initially, Trump didn't seem too interested in the idea. Uh, but finally, at an Iowa event, Trump tried out the line. We have to build a fence. And it's got to be a beauty. Who can build better than Trump? I build. It's what I do. And the crowd just roared. Trump, who's a very intuitive politician, saw that this drew an enormous response from his audience. So I would say that if I run, and if I win, I would certainly start by building a very, very powerful border. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. This was something that really galvanized a lot of hard-right, anti-immigrant voters who became 
uh, the strength of his political base. Beautiful, thank you. Donald Trump wasn't gonna do nuance. Americans don't want nuance. With the immigration thing. One thing he said to me was, he goes, Sam, you write things that are too fucking complicated. Who the fuck can understand this? And you know what? He was 100% right. One way that Trump became convinced that this issue had real power and salience with grassroots conservatives was that when he tweeted about illegal immigration, he would get hundreds and hundreds of retweets. I introduced him to Twitter with Roger Stump. So we're working for him, and we're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to continue to get paid? And Roger says to me, we're going to work on his Twitter. And we just started sending in suggested tweets. Donald Trump's political ideology is called Donald Trump. He's very malleable. His gut instinct is to be a populist. It's to be whatever's driving the American people crazy. And so he has been open to and susceptible to all kinds of conspiracy ideas. Trump was using Twitter as a focus group to hone the issues that he would later run on, seeing what it was that would resonate with his followers and what wouldn't. He'd be on the plane and he'd have this big Samsung phone in his hand and he'd be fat fingering a tweet and then obviously he's pressing send and you're praying that there's no spelling mistakes and then boom, we're watching satellite TV and it's up, you know, the Chiron's up, you know. Trump says blah, 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 you know, and you're like laughing. I told him, you gotta stop, stop tweeting. You're creating headaches for yourself, stop tweeting. He's like, why should I stop tweeting when I can bypass the fake news companies in this country and go directly to the American people? And millions of people right. between Twitter and Facebook. I'll be at five million people. That's more than the biggest media company. You know how many people on Twitter every day ask me to run for president? Please, Mr. Trump, run for president. Please, Mr. Trump, you're the only one who can save the country. Thanks to the internet, and thanks especially to social media, he's starting to connect on issues that he thinks will speak to the emotional gap in uh, Americans' political experience. That brought him into a world of people who were outside the mainstream, sometimes even beyond the mainstream of Fox News. They included the folks who worked at Breitbart News, where a lot of ideas about American nationalism, about fighting back against multiculturalism, were being built up by Steve Bannon, a former Hollywood producer who had turned himself into kind of the voice of Breitbart News. The center core of what we believe, that we're a nation with an economy, not an economy just in some global marketplace with open borders, but we are a nation with a, a culture and a, uh, and a reason for being. And I think that's what unites us. Trump became a fan of Bannon's work. And they bonded over the idea that the United States was in uh, deep, dark trouble. Bannon starts briefing Trump on politics. Trump, who doesn't use computers, isn't going to read these articles on a phone or on his computer. So Trump's staff actually prints out the Breitbart News articles on paper and hands them to Trump in a manila folder. Breitbart didn't come off as academic and nerdy. I couldn't get Trump to read something from the Wall Street Journal. He's not going to read something that he's not interested in. But if Breitbart wrote something about it, he would look at it. If you look at the issues that Breitbart News is most concerned about, it tends to be things like the idea that immigrants from Mexico are marauding killers and rapists who pose a dire threat to the American citizenry. He started listening to a diet of right-wing conversation that was not mainstream Republicanism and bought into a series of conspiracy theories that got wilder and wilder about immigrants coming in and stealing American jobs. Bannon was in Trump's ear telling him, we need to double down on these ideas. This is really resonating with the Republican base. We need strong borders. We need a wall. There's no doubt that as the years went by, Trump got much more angry and much darker. The fact is, we're run by either very foolish or very stupid people. He's really being indoctrinated with the Breitbart worldview. You're going to have people just flowing into this country 
worse than it's ever been. Then when he gets glommed onto, in a sense, by uh, the Breitbart right, the kind of ideology found its angry man, and the angry man found its ideology. They struck a chord with Donald Trump because they appealed to his sense of himself as the outsider, sneered at by the elites, who saw him as this caricature, as this sort of clown, and he always resented that. Washington is totally broken, and it's not going to get fixed unless we put the right person in that top position. CPAC, give it up. Donald Trump. Thank you. Is he serious this time or just selling something? The real estate mogul and reality TV star has flirted with White House runs before. I love playing a tape on television and radio where all of these people were laughing, run, Donald, run, please, you'll never win. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Look, look at me. Do it. I will personally write you a campaign check now. Trump's running for president. Like, this is your worst nightmare. People think that Donald Trump is a clown. Does anybody seriously think that Donald Trump is serious about running for president? He doesn't take on fights that he doesn't think he can win. Donald Trump wants to win at everything he does. I remember saying to myself, what's going to happen when The Apprentice goes off the air? What's he going to do? He can't go back to just being a B-level developer. It was about, I'm not going to be a star anymore. The focus is not going to be on me. How could I keep the cameras pointed at me? Because he didn't want those lights to go out. Well, we got the answer, didn't we? When I write about people, I get to know them. Implicitly, I'm trying to draw out of them their inner selves in order to get at that essence. We're driving up the interstate. I'm taking notes. We're talking. I really was determined to answer this question that was bugging me about what goes on inside this person's being. What is the nature of that private self? And so I said, what time do you wake up? I knew he didn't sleep much. And he said, you know, 5.30. I said, okay, everyone's asleep, you're awake, you're in your bathroom, you're shaving, you're looking in the mirror. What do you see? And silence. He doesn't have an answer to the question. And I said, well, are you looking in the mirror and thinking, Gee, I'm Donald Trump. And he still doesn't respond. By the time I was done with him, I was able to reach a conclusion about his interior life. And with Trump, the essence was, was a vacuum. I think what has kept him going is a need to feed an emptiness. He had aspired to and achieved the ultimate luxury. He lives like a king, but for all the things that should give one pleasure, there is something lacking in those pleasures. And he's been trying to feed that emptiness. There is an unfillable hole inside this person. And I think that that is his, his fear and his destiny both. He wanted me there around 7. I got there at 7.30 because I'm always late. He's in a black suit with the red tie and the white shirt. And he says, what do you think? Should I change? I said, I love it. He goes, no, you're a fucking idiot. I'm going to change. And Melania comes down, Mrs. Trump. And I'm like, holy shit. Jesus, look at that dress she's wearing. You see her back. And God, is she gorgeous. And here's something nobody is going to believe, even when I tell you this. He prayed. He went like this. And then he said, OK, let's go. When 
everybody else was going crazy, including a lot of my colleagues at Fox News about Donald Trump may get into this race, I remember saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Lo and behold, on a June morning in 2015, he and Melania come down that escalator. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. Donald Trump takes on 16 seasoned, powerful, professional politicians, and one by one, he's knocking them out of the race. He's rewritten the rule book. And they're killing us at the border, and they're killing us in trade. The American dream is dead. But we're fighting for you, so what's good for me is good for you, and I mean that totally 100%. But while this is going on, Trump was not done with Russia. In 2015, Felix Sater, Trump's business partner from Bayrock, accidentally bumbles into the dream deal of anybody in the Trump orbit. A friend of his lets him know that he has some property in Moscow. Felix instantly thinks, could that be a Trump Tower Moscow? The thing that Trump has wanted more than anything forever. Felix Sater emails Michael Cohen, Trump's personal lawyer, and says, I have secured financing for Trump Ta Moscow from VTB Bank. It's a Russian state bank. VTB Bank is not really a bank in any traditional sense. It's more like a tool of the Kremlin. Putin. A tool of Putin and his cronies to get money where they want. It was also sanctioned after Russia annexed Crimea as a way to punish specifically Putin and his cronies. That didn't seem to put them off any. There are no emails in which Michael Cohn says, hey, we can't work with a sanctioned bank. It's sort of like, well, you keep going, Felix. I approached Michael Cohen about the opportunity. He was very excited. Very Donald Trump you. signed a letter of intent. This is not a secret from Trump. Trump knows about this. Trump signs a letter of intent. They get pretty far into the weeds. How much money Trump would get up front, $4 million, just for moving ahead. There would be a spa, and the spa might even be called Spa by Ivanka. I mean, they're really getting to details. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here. Trump's running for president. Here you have an American presidential candidate doing a business deal with a bank in Russia sanctioned by the U.S. government. Does any American voter know about this? No, it's a secret. I humbly and gratefully accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails. I have nothing to do with Russia. Who's going to pay for the wall? Who? Honestly, she should be locked up. You know what we're going to do? Even better, we're going to beat her on November 8th. With your help, we are going to win. And we are going to win big. This is CNN Breaking News. The American people have spoken. Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. All right, so you know I'm trying to march you through your life. Yeah, and, right. and you are in the present. Yeah, well, I'm, You're I'm, always in the present. I, I'm never in the past. <laughs> right, I know, I know. I mean, the it's problem you'll have with me is I'm not in the past. I'm, yeah. I'm a person that thinks to the future and the present. I don't think people change very much. You may slow down. But honestly, yeah, I don't think people change. I think I'm a very big believer in the fact that when you are a certain way, pretty much that's the way you are. 
Now environmental situations change, conditions change, wealth changes, both up and down. But I think basically a personality is set from very close to the time of birth. I mean, if I look at myself in the first grade and I look at myself now, I don't think I'm that different. Now I have vast experience, I have vast success. Like I've had these tremendous successes and then I'm off to the next one. I just don't like wasting time on the past. I don't like to analyze myself because I might not like what I see. The Trumps are one of the wealthiest families in America. He felt constricted by his father's world of the outer boroughs. I worked in Brooklyn for my father. I did very well, but I always wanted to be in Manhattan. The 1973 lawsuit alleges rampant discrimination on the part of the Trump Organization. Roy Cohn assures Donald that they can go into this and win. They don't. They lose. They have to settle with the federal government. Donald Trump, through a complicated series of absolute moxie maneuvers, managed to get a huge tax break. People ask me, how is it that you got 40 years of tax abatement? And I'd always say, because I didn't ask for 50. Donald Trump is the consummate, constant negotiator. My uh, father, Fred. Right. Fred Trump was amazed that his little boy had graduated to a premier address in Manhattan. He was not yet 40 years old, and he was a force to be reckoned with. I didn't tell you the story about the, the people that, that I met at a lounge, right? No. So there was this group at a lounge. They're better than the stars. Better than Frank Sinatra. Better. But they're a lounge act. In many ways, Donald Trump does see life in Darwinian terms. It's survival of the fittest. The world is made of winners and losers. The winners achieve at a very high level, and everyone else is a loser. You were saying about this lounge act. Oh, oh yeah. A tremendously talented person. You would be entertained beyond anything you've ever seen. So I'm being honored by Police Athletic League. Steve Ross is the co-chairman. He's a good friend of mine. He lived in this building. I said, Steve, you got to do me a favor. Let's get this guy. He'll blow him away. Where do you see? I told the guy, I said, you have got tonight a chance to be a star. Mm. He said, do a great job. So he's driving up, and he was some place down in New Jersey. And he's driving to the event, and he's in an automobile. Mm. And he's injured and gets taken to the hospital. So I go, ladies and gentlemen, our performer didn't make it tonight. And I said, that's why he's a lounge act. He's a lounge act. After that, I never, I never promote him again. You know, I thought I was doing a guy a favor. He was meant to be a lounge act. He always will be a lounge act. That's the way it is. The world really was made up of winners and losers, and there was really nothing in between. Losers deserve no respect.
American dream has always been to become a millionaire. For the people who have nothing, do you think that's a reality today? Excuse me. I can hear all of you over there, and I can't concentrate, so could all of you please disappear? Thank you. You are 34 years old. Where did you get the incentive? I mean, oh. 34, it's so young, Donald. Well, I don't look at, really, in my case, necessarily incentive. I enjoy what I'm doing. I really enjoy what I'm doing. I look at it as being somewhat creative. And I find this business to be show business, frankly. You know, in terms of what we've done, I'd like to make it a little bit show busy. Because I don't like show business that much. I do like the real estate business, but I like the concept of show business as, relates, as it relates to the real estate business. Trump's skill from the very beginning, it's building Trump the brand, building Trump the man as the centerpiece, as the character that people in America will aspire to be like. They're driven by the name. When Donald built Trump Tower, it was a monumental accomplishment. Because nothing had really been done like this before. Since its opening in February, it's become a major landmark. It was a tourist attraction. There's no other residential building that people walk down Fifth Avenue to walk into. And they want to see it. They want to know what it's like. They want to touch it and feel it. He realized his name is his power. This is his brand. He put it on there bigger and better than anybody did. Trump, 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 Trump. And guess what? People walked away and said, that's Donald Trump's. Donald Trump is a major deal maker, a swashbuckler. He takes chances that would make a less daring man shudder. And he has made his money mainly from Manhattan real estate. From the very beginning, Donald had a natural understanding of how to build his brand. realize what Americans really loved was celebrity. If you were a celebrity, everything was possible. He does what you want, Shania. He watched commercials where you have ball players and everyone else endorsing products. The beauty Miss Pantyhose can make any legs look like a million dollars. People buy them because they're associated with glamour. And he decided if it can sell popular drinks, it could sell his real estate. America's favorite coffee maker. So he wanted to become a celebrity as a developer. He knew that he wanted to be famous and fabulous and terrific. And he was going to do whatever it took to get there. Who do you turn to? Everyone knows the most famous legal legal, my pal and yours, Roy Cohn. Good evening, Nikki. How are you? Roy was a tough guy and usually a trendsetter and really had his finger on the pulse of what was going on. He's a familiar figure in the best restaurants and tailors and barber shops. The rich and the powerful and famous seek him out. Trump saw a powerful lawyer who could open Manhattan to him, who could open his magic Rolodex and introduce him to everyone. All of the people that young Donald Trump coming in from Queens wanted to meet. What motivates Roy Cohn? Uh, I would say power motivates me. Having power motivates me. Because by having power, I am able to do things. These parties were the weirdest kind of panoply of people. The wealth, the power that was concentrated in his living room. Andy Warhol was in the corner, and Norman Mailer would strut in. Barbara Walters would stop in. Mike Wallace came to a couple of parties, and then Donald Trump shows up. When young Donald Trump would come into the room, the energy around Roy would change. He would say, Donald is here, Donald is here, almost as if there was some sort of uh, attraction. Once in a while, he'll escort a model that New York's matchmakers have given up on. He's just not the married kind. Roy was of a time when in a certain part of New York, it was okay to be gay, so long as you weren't out there gay. He was embarrassed about being gay, and he needed that secret held from the public. It would have ruined his macho image. Trump was 
keenly aware that uh, Cohn was gay, uh, and to Trump that was totally fine. He never made any uh, problem of that because he valued Cohn for his connections. This is a picture that hangs in my office uh, directly alongside one of the President and Mrs. Reagan, two of my favorite people. And the picture uh, is of Donald and me in which he says, uh, Roy is my greatest friend. He always has time for little things, for friends. He, he never forgets to make a phone call. If he says he'll do something, you know it's done. Roy would fight for me to the death. For me. Right. Not everybody. But not for everybody. Yeah. He was very loyal, amazing. He would kill for a person that he really liked. Ostensibly, Roy was just Trump's lawyer. But he was so much more. He was a fixer. He was a connector. He was a maker. He was a mentor. He believed in Trump. And Trump knew that Roy could be a father figure, a teacher. He was the one who introduced Trump to Manhattan. Fasten your jet set seatbelts. It's the Nikki Haspo Show, direct from New York. Next stop for me, the world famous Studio 54. It was the hottest club in town, because you couldn't get in. There were thousands of people all the way around the block. One of the bouncers, Maitre D's, would walk down the line and he would actually select people that were able to come in. You know, he would look at you and say, you can come, you can't, so on and so forth. Roy was able to get Donald Trump to pass, so he didn't wait online. He got right into Studio 54. Trump, who was chasing models at the time, took great pleasure that Roy Cohn helped do that for him. Trump would go about getting himself noticed by the photographers and the TV cameras with whatever celebrity was there, whether it was Madonna or one of the new models. Oh, there was women everywhere there. I mean, there was rooms in there. There was one section where you, you'd go in and have sex in there if you want. Now, I never did that, I'll be honest with you, but it was, it was a crazy place. Donald believed that every woman loved him and that women were drawn to him. You were such a straight arrow. Well, I wasn't straight in the sense that, uh, you know, I would be wild in other ways. But I was never a oh, drinker. God. I was what never... What did you ever do that was wild? Well, I loved women. Donald Trump was never a man who was dying to settle down. He was a playboy about town. I think that Trump always felt that being surrounded by beautiful women was part of the aura he needed to develop. He felt that a uh, surround sound of blondes, tens as he would call them, was essential for his look. I was with seven models all okay. month long, and the girlfriend says, well, let's go out for dinner. Hmm. So we went to Maximal Plan. When I interviewed Ivana, she told me about the chance encounter that was going to change her life. Of course, it was a packed place you know, at the time. Somebody tapped me on my shoulder. So I turned <laughs> around and I saw this tall, blonde guy with blue eyes. And I said, what's your name? He said, I'm Donald Trump. He very ostentatiously volunteered to make sure they were seated if they let him join them. So I turned to my girlfriends and I said, I have a good news and bad news. <laughs> good news is they are going to get at the table right away. Bad news is the, you know, the guy is going to sit with us. We got a table in about 10 minutes and we sat down. And before end of the evening, Donna disappeared. Huh. So I asked for the bill, said it was taken care of. So we went outside, and there's a big limo with Donna driving the limousine. <laughs> he took us to our hotel, and next day I got us three dozen of the roses, and uh, I went back to Montreal. He starts pursuing her on the phone, sending her notes, flowers, letters, and lots and lots of clippings about himself and his nascent business career. She's fairly impressed by this guy. Ivana is a child in communist Czechoslovakia. She was relatively deprived. 
with her father. He sent her to a skiing camp when she was 14 in Italy. And that's what originally introduced her to the luxuries of the West. Beautiful jewelry and clothing, perfumes and luxury cars. And that became a touchstone, I think, for her life that has never changed. When he asked her to marry him, she said yes. Donald really wanted to marry Ivana. Ivana had other choices, and she chose Donald. The wedding was lovely. Ivana was a beautiful bride, very simple. Very soon after Donald and Ivana are married, the children arrive. First Ivana was a boy, which was fantastic. The pressure was up. The second one was a girl, which is just adorable. And the third one was a boy again, so my job is done. I said, that's it, shop is closed. You want to hold it? Go ahead, go ahead. Hello, hello. Come on over, folks. Try and blow all the candles out with one breath, okay, honey? One Make breath. a wish. One Make breath. A wish. Make a big wish, Did and then when you're ready, blow the candles out, okay? Donald and Ivana were the golden couple, and they were very much a part of what was going on. They were on the scene. They were at every ball of the Met or opening of the opera. You would actually see the two of them in these kind of places, which were the essential Park Avenue, I've arrived kind of evening out. Both Donald and Ivana were wedded by this mutual ambition to become even wealthier than they already were and to become part of the celebrity circuit in Manhattan. She was a reflection on him. She was so beautiful. She really, really was beautiful. He liked hearing that. My wife and helper and uh, a lady of very good taste. So I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to have her back. She keeps, she keeps me toned down a little bit. I think. Donald, to the extent that he can love anyone, loves Ivana. He certainly appeared to. He, he respected her tremendously. He gave her a position of some power because he thought that she could handle it, and he thought she was very smart. In many ways, Ivana was a better business person than Donald because she knew the numbers. Ivana was a very important, more important than people realize, a figure in Trump's rise. Donald Trump, back in the day, was a flirt, he was fun, he was like almost all the developers in New York City. They put up glass and mirrors, and they are glass and mirrors. He was just part of the bloodstream of New York society, New York business, New York tabloids. You just knew him. Well, there's a lot of coverage in that. I first encountered Donald Trump in a very typical New York way. It was my first job for New York Newsday, and I'd written a column on Donald Trump, and I said he looked like he'd had a couple of extra sandwiches. <laughs> he got so mad that he had an, uh, a, a mutual friend introduce us to prove that he wasn't fat. <laughs> I really was always very, very fond of him as a New York character. He works the tabloids from the start, cultivates the gossip columnists, makes himself useful to the reporters to tell them to cover events that he would be appearing at. You've read about him on the front page of the New York Post and the New York Daily News, sometimes in the business section of the New York Times. He was a big deal. He was generating and grooming this image of himself as a successful millionaire. You are seen at all the right parties. You are on the covers of all the magazines. Do you cultivate a high profile? No, I don't. For some reason, I mean, uh, people call and they want to do something. If Newsweek calls and they say, Donald, we want to do a cover story, I guess you sort of have to go along with it. And that happened, and other things happen. And it's just something that happens, Jane. I can't really tell you why. Maybe you can tell you are me. You are Mr. Make It Happen. Well, it does You happen. make things happen in Well, your that's life. good. That's what I want to do. He would call you up and plant stories. I'll tell you what, Bernie, come in and see me. Let you and I talk, and then we'll see. Uh, we'll go from that stage. Does that sound all right? We knew he was lying and 
calling everybody with the same story to see who'd bite. But once you got a real relationship with him, he was very honorable about only calling you with his fake stories. <laughs> the press actually loved him because what you discover with press, they love access, right? I mean, it's a hard thing to write columns every day. And the people that you, in the end, love and give the most attention to, if you're a gossip columnist, the ones who give you the most access and will let you in. A little wave at the press as you sail off into the sunset. Yeah. You don't like this one, I think. And they repay you with coverage. Did you get enough shots today, fellas? He became a media store. Can this way, please? Thank you. I think the media and Donald Trump were a perfect marriage. Together, we created a baby. And the baby was Donald Trump, the character. We created a monster. And he couldn't have done it on his own, and we couldn't have created that persona without him. The tabloids provided an element of glamour to him. It all added, in his mind, up to the the Trump brand. The press has really come because of the kind of projects that I'm building. If, if I do Trump Tower in New York, people love it. And the press loves it. And people like reading about it. And of course, the challenge to anyone who is as ambitious as Donald Trump is, is keeping it going. He has to look for more ways to define himself as a winner and a success. Well, our first guest tonight on Live at Five is a very familiar face, needs no introduction. A billionaire real estate tycoon, Donald Trump. He has now written a book. The name of the book is The Art of the Deal, which you uh, wrote with Tony Schwartz. When he told me he was doing a book, I said, well, what's the book? And he said, well, it's my autobiography. And I said, if I were you, I'd, I'd write a book called The Art of the Deal. His instant response was, yeah, I like that. Do you want to write it? I don't run my business that way. Yeah. See, the one problem I have with this, off the record... Minutes into the very first interview, he literally jumped out of his chair and said, I'm just sick of this. Okay, do you have enough now? It was clear that Trump was incredibly impatient and had a very short attention span. What dawned on me was that there was another way to do the book. He lived on the phone. I was writing about deals, and deals were what he focused on most of the time over the phone. Yes, uh, Mr. Roden, please. Donald Trump. If he wasn't making a deal, he was talking to somebody in the media. Right, I know, and, and I have it very much in mind. When do you want to get together? So I started coming in like a job. I'd come in at 9 in the morning, and I'd stay till 5. And I'd just listen. What do you think it's worth? Unless you have an agreement, you don't even have to go public on that. Push him hard on that low. Is that a low price? Let's get the thing, let's get it done. Okay, you take care, so long. Because he didn't provide many details, I started going out and interviewing the people he was talking to. Then I ran into a problem, which was, if I asked them about what happened in these deals, it was not what Trump told me had happened in these deals. It was quite different. It frankly happens to be good for them. It never reflected on him in quite the winning way his description of his role in the deal reflected on him. It was during that period that I came up with the phrase truthful hyperbole. It means essentially that what you're saying is false. But the whole persona that I was working to create for Trump, to make him more winning than he actually was, was to pass that kind of thing off in a breezy, lighthearted way. And it set him up to be a national celebrity. Trump, the art of the deal. You're a star, Mr. Trump, and you're a businessman. I'm telling you that the turning point in Donald's life was when he wrote The Art of the Deal. Then everything fell into place. This was the calling card that would get him attention on national television. If I can help people to make deals, that's great. But if I can help people not to make deals that shouldn't be doing it, mm -hmm. maybe that's just as good. Every time I come on your show, I sell a lot of books. So I don't that's know exactly. making your things. You're making your no, things? You? It would actually put him in the hands of millions of readers who absorbed this message of success and doing what it takes to win at all costs. You think he's a good businessman?
Here Donald has all these successful projects going. He's the toast of the town, but he had his eyes set on another level of acceptance. My name's Jonathan Greenberg. I was tapped to start the Forbes 400, which is a list of the richest Americans. The first year of the Forbes 400, we listed Donald Trump as like 350th on the list, only for 100 million. He wanted to be at the very top of the list, and it literally hurt him that there were people who were worth more money on the list than that everyone was going to know it. I'm there at my desk, and the, the uh, receptionist at Forbes called me, Jonathan Roy Cohn, on the phone. He said, I understand you're doing this list of uh, rich people, and Donnie's asked me to give you a call because it seems like you don't have the right information. What do you think of his net worth? I think it's a little over 700 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I forget what they printed, something like 200 million or 300 million. And one of the banks called up and uh, started griping about it. What, what would you base that on? Uh, the Trump Tower has been going like a house of fire, and the profits on that are much higher than had been anticipated. And so in the second year of the Forbes 400, I upped his net worth to $200 million. And then in May of 1984, I was doing the Forbes 400 once again. I received a call from John Barron, the vice president of finance for the Trump organization. Mr. Trump, he's got tremendous cash and tremendous cash flow. In two years, I mean, I know what he's going to do. He's going to buy up everybody's buildings for thirty cent dollars And that's been his secret. And then you could take one building is worth more than what you had as, as the net worth, and it just never made sense. Okay, what's your first name then? John. 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 Many years later, I had 60 boxes of folders and tapes that I had shipped back from New York to California when I moved. And I start looking through it, and I see the tape, and it's like, John Barron, VP of Finance. I never even remembered that I interviewed John Barron. And I said, I've got to listen to this tape. The reason that Trump made all his money is that he, what he did is he took buildings and instead of selling them, uh, you know, as a building, he took chunks out of the building in the form of condominium units and sold them for the highest prices ever attained. I realized that I had been conned. John Barron was Donald Trump and I never knew it. What really shocked me was how calculated and deliberate the deception was. There's so much exaggeration that you don't know which are the lies and which are true. And in fact, what's interesting about it, acting as John Barron off the record, he feels that he could speak candidly about how he really feels about his father. We're working on a short profile of Fred Trump, the businessman, Donald Trump's father. Fine, he's a great guy. He also has a great liking for his son, I guess. Does that come through or? Oh yeah. They have a, they have a very extraordinary relationship. Uh, which is nice because you and I and a lot of people have seen where there's a jealousy on behalf of a son or a father or whatever, and it's, you know, it's a disaster. They have an incredible relationship. And I, I can tell you because, you know, I've seen it for a long time. It was not an easy thing initially. You know, you, you, Fred Trump is not exactly what you call, uh, you know, he, he's a very strong man, as I'm sure you've got. Yeah, that is what we've got. And breaking through that mold and then even surpassing it uh, is, was, was not like, you know, you just happened to surpass it. It was just a, a very, you know, it was a struggle. A friendly struggle, but a very strong struggle. It's hard to know what the real building blocks of that craving for attention, that craving for respect, where that comes from. We know that his father was extremely tough on him. He said to Donald over and over, you need to go out there and succeed like no one else has before. You can't just be a regular guy. And so he was tremendously driven by his father. I think that just the right amount of insecurity can make a drive that can take you all the way through life. And in the case of Trump, I think was a huge driving force to him. Made him want to be bigger, brasher, richer, more press, more bylines, more beautiful wives. It always was about more. What I found out was that in 1982, Donald Trump's real net worth was well under the $100 million that I thought he was worth. 
Donald Trump knew you could lie and bluster and bluff and mow over people and it would all get you what you wanted. And Trump learned that from Roy. Donald Trump convinced me that he owned half of his father's real estate in Queens. Are you saying that the ownership has been transferred to Donald Trump? Correct. That's correct. In excess of 90 percent, yes. Not only did he not own over 90 percent of his father's real estate in Queens, but he'd used the Forbes 400 to inflate net worth to the banks. Why didn't Forbes, a preeminent business publication, discover this? Well, you're dealing with private organizations. So he can make claims that he owns this and he owns that, and it's very hard to verify. So for many years, they had to go with whatever Donald told them. Anybody inside a bank that sees who's in the top Forbes 400 would want to try to associate the bank with people on that list because they would be deemed to be the most marketable and the most credit worthy. Without getting on the Forbes 400, Donald Trump would not have been able to borrow the money that he borrowed to build his business empire. That was the beginning of his brand. Trump at this point is embarking on a massive spending spree that he can't really finance with money from his own wallet. He is being financed by banks, and the banks are giving him loans almost in a willing suspension of disbelief. In 1985, he bought Mar-a-Lago, a 118-room mansion in Palm Beach. He bought the venerable Eastern Shuttle. Of course, he named it Trump. The price, 365 million cash. I wonder what he's going to buy next. I don't know. The most publicity he has ever gotten, however, right. was from his sudden decision to buy a football team. Every time he turned around, he bought something else that was icon of stupendous wealth. What he was really doing was building this Trump brand into something that could roll its way over anything. I was assigned to handle New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut for the Reagan campaign of 1980. We'll restore hope and we'll welcome them into a great national crusade to make America great again. Roger Stone, he was part of a group with Lee Atwater and Paul Manafort. They were young, they were aggressive, they were ambitious, they were very tough, and they didn't shy away from politics as a blood sport. It was war and they were determined to win it. I was invited to a dinner party and Roy was at the party. And I introduced myself and I made my pitch for Reagan and why I thought he could win. Roy looked out the window for a little bit and he returned to me and said, what you need is Donald Trump. Roy had a way of spotting political talent. Roy looked at Trump and saw something, someone who could arise in American politics. Where do you see his future? If ever there were a man in America who fought big, it's Donald. I think New York is just a small part. I think he looks at the whole United States, and I think that cities and peoples who have read about him in national magazines and all that are someday, not too far distant future, going to find him right at their doorstep. Welcome to the 11th hour. I mean, you've taken a posture as more than just a developer, more than just a guy making money. I've been watching this country systematically being ripped off by Japan and West Germany and so many others. They're laughing at us. They think we are the biggest fools, the dumbest people in the world. By the late 1980s, it's impossible to separate Trump's 
political ambition from his personal ambition. They really are one and the same. Well, I'm a proud American. I mean, I have a great feeling for this country, Larry. I love this country. I think it's a great country. Donald Trump is a political figure as advertising man. That's why the country is losing billions and hundreds of billions of dollars today, because of a mistake in the tax law. He is a great sloganeer. We have countries out there that are so-called allies, and I use the word so-called because they're a disaster for this country. He is great at presenting a small soundbite that is going to provoke emotion. We're going to have a war through weakness, because this country is acting so weak toward Iran, it's pathetic. Before 1988, I first suggested to Donald Trump why don't you make a major speech and see what the coverage is like? Well, he liked that idea. I arranged for him to speak in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Trump had attracted over 900 people, more than three times the audience that turned out for Senator Robert Dole. This is the first time I saw the phenomena of Donald Trump within the context of a political milieu. He has charisma, he has a certain command presence. It's not just that he's tall and broad-shouldered and handsome, but there's a self-confidence about him that is uh, very attractive. It was electric. He was on fire. People wanted to know, does this mean you're running for president? Live from the Louisiana Superdome, the Republicans in New Orleans. The Republican convention uh, in 1988 was held in New Orleans. It was only at the very last minute that Donald said, you know, I think I'll go to the convention. Thanks, Ken. One foreign policy... I was a floor reporter for NBC. And one of the things as a floor reporter you do is that you just circle the floor, looking to see who's there. And I'm walking around and suddenly I see Donald Trump. Well, Lord knows, He's interesting. You have flirted with the idea of politics. Now you're here at your first national convention. Does that get you interested in possibly making the plunge? Now you have to tell me something. Who told you I flirted? Well, I, mean, I didn't know that I flirted. Well, you and know. what surprises me is how little things have changed. His immediate instinct is to joust with you, to push back, to question your assumptions. But you have said that if you ran for president, you'd win. I think I'd have a very good chance. I mean, I like to win. When I do something, I like to win. I like to, uh, I like to do well, and I think I probably would have a pretty good chance. And that's part of the fascination of Donald Trump. For more than a quarter of a century, he's been one of the greatest shows on Earth. You don't know what he's going to do next. You don't know what's going to happen to him next. And you can't stop watching. Roy called me. He said, they want to do another interview of me at 60 Minutes. I said, don't do it, Roy. You're going to make it a big mistake. Nothing good's happening for you now. Everyone was going after him. There's nothing good happening. Controversy has surrounded this man. Today, at 58, he's still the combative lawyer, fighting two of the greatest battles of his life. I saw him in a couple of events, and he just looked sickly. He looked thin. And the rumor was that he had AIDS. Were those reports true? No. Categorically, no, I do not. Do you have AIDS? Oh, no. That's easy to answer. Just hold on. You have to make a very special wish. I went to his birthday party in 1986. Big people came to pay their respects. Norman Mailer, Helen Gurley Brown, Lee Iacocca, also present, Cone's the constant companion, Peter Frazier. And Trump walked in. Trump toasted him. Everybody said how wonderful Roy was. Roy made this whole thing about, you know, we'll see you next year. We're going to have more to celebrate next year. There was a sense that there was not going to be a next year. When Roy was sick, that's when they went after him. They didn't go after him when he was healthy. It just shows you how vicious the world is. You're licensed to practice law. There's been an effort made to take it away from you uh, on the grounds that uh, you committed fraud. The establishment bar hates my guts because I'm unconventional. I'm an iconoclast. I call things the way I see them. The charges are total flat nonsense. Did you see him when he was really sick? I never really did, and he didn't want people to see him. 
I never really saw him when he was sick. During that time when Cohn was nearing his death, Trump pulled away completely, uh, cut off connections, didn't talk to him, didn't visit with him. Roy Cohn was too ill to deliver for him, and he's, Donald's a transactional guy. There's a long pattern in Donald Trump's life of uh, essentially washing people who uh, are not successful out of his life. What Trump will often do is say, well, I never really knew that person. What did you see in Roy that his critics didn't see? Well, Roy was one of my lawyers. He wasn't my lawyer. He was one of my lawyers. What have these last few months been like for you? I think the most unusual experience that a human being can endure, Mike, it's been a living death. I lived my funeral. I saw who was at my funeral, who wasn't at my funeral. Roy Cohn uh, died feeling very bitter towards Donald Trump. Trump did show up to the funeral, but he stood in the back, never took a seat, never said anything, and then left early. You feel well, like that Roy, you stuck by Roy Cohn, and that, I do. that's true. I think you I showed did. your stripes by doing that. Well, I don't think I showed my stripes. I think, you see, I'm so loyal to people, and maybe I'm loyal to a fault, but I'm so loyal to people that when somebody's slightly disloyal to me, I look upon it as a great act of horror. After Roy died, the IRS seized almost everything he had. But the one thing that his companion, Peter Fraser, got was a box that Trump had given Roy toward the end as a gift for all his years of service. And it was a pair of diamond-studded cufflinks. And Peter went to get these cufflinks appraised. And the appraiser said, these are total fakes. They're worth nothing. So that was Donald Trump's parting gift to Roy. Nothing. It's almost hard to imagine someone being as voracious as Donald Trump was in the 1980s. He went from a success at the Grand Hyatt, an even bigger success with Trump Tower, writing a book, The Art of the Deal. And after all that, he was going to embark on his riskiest gamble yet. Not so many years ago, this eastern seashore city with its spectacular skyline was an obscure little fishing village. Today, Atlantic City stands preeminent among the great resorts of the world. In the early days, Atlantic City was the queen of resorts. My parents used to take me there for the whole summer. During the day, people would go to the beach, and at night, people would dress in jackets and ties. And they'd sit on the rolling chairs, and it was a wonderful kind of display. But things started to really go downhill in the 70s. People weren't coming there. There was a lot of dilapidated housing. It just didn't have the allure that it had in previous decades. There was a lot of debate in New Jersey about what are we going to do? Is Atlantic City going to fall into the sea? And they ultimately came up with an idea of legalizing gambling. This casino is now open. What was once a quiet seaside resort isn't that way anymore. Atlantic City has turned from a dying town into a lively gambling mecca. Atlantic City's gambling casinos are raking in the money at a near record clip. Various casino companies and developers started putting up casinos along the boardwalk. I'm ready to lose it in two minutes. I always lose, but I love it. I said, Donald, all your interests and connections and money are in New York. Why are you going to Atlantic City? And he gave me the exact same answer that Willie Sutton, the great bank robber, answered when they asked him why did he rob banks, and he said that's where the money is. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to Atlantic City. The New Jersey voters have approved legalized gambling for Atlantic City. Very few people doubt that open gambling will bring a lot of money to Atlantic City. The real question is, who will get most of it? In the 1980s, in Atlantic City, Trump in quick succession opens two casinos there, Trump Plaza and Trump Castle. Okay, 
Okay, now is the time, folks. All right. Go ahead. Since he's never run a casino and didn't know anything about running a casino, he needed an operator. Can you give us your full name and your title again? Stephen Hyde, Stephen Frank Hyde, if you want the full name. Stephen Hyde, President, Trump Plaza. Donald hired Steve Hyde to come in and be his guy at the Trump Plaza, and Donald's wife, Ivana, was running the castle. She helicopters down to Atlantic City four days a week from New York to oversee Trump Castle. Recently, Ivana Trump has been coming in neck and neck and ahead of the competition. It was very clear back then that there was an unbelievable level of trust that he had in Ivana. She was a meticulous operator. You just don't want to be there and do the job. You want to be the best at it. She kept the facility beautiful in the style that Donald wanted. Donald was not involved in the day-to-day -day operation. He would make his weekly trips, and he would bounce from Steve's office to my office. The biggest challenge was managing his personality and his mood swings. You could get him for five to 10 minutes of his attention, and then that was it. But he did have a flamboyance that I thought was very well suited to the gambling industry. The fight of this magnitude could only be brought together by guys like Donald Trump, who has the daring, the flair, the look, and the cash to make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Tyson versus Spinks, once and for all. We were competing for the first time with Las Vegas. They dominated boxing. They got all the publicity for boxing. That's the kind of attention and the glamour that Donald Trump wanted. So the atmosphere the night of a big fight was electric because now the celebrities are coming in. I'm a very big fight, especially if they're not hitting me. Every news station from all over the country is there. Donald Trump's reputation and his reach, so to speak, went up dramatically as a result of the fights because people that would have never come to Atlantic City came to Atlantic City for these events. At the moment this fight happened, in the late 1980s, you are probably at peak Trump. His dream of Hollywood-style celebrities been fulfilled. A right -hand land for the head of Mike Frank. He's being celebrated on magazine covers as the new wonderkin of American business and American real estate. For the, body. the deal maker. Oh, oh. He leaves the right hand. Down he goes. I don't think he'll get up from this. Donald Trump in the late 1980s was it. It's seven, it's eight, it's all over. He believed that he was infallible. He believed that he could do magic with money, and he believed that nothing would get in his way. But there's always this missing piece of gratification with him, and I think it's because he needs the next fix. is regarded as a very successful hotelier in Atlantic City. The Trump Castle becomes one of the best hotels down there. How do you feel about all these people here to say goodbye to you? I think it's fantastic. I think it's a great honor to me and to whole Trump organization. <laughs> the greatest toy that I could give Ivana would be to put her at the Plaza Hotel. Donald moved Ivana from this job that she was doing very well at the Trump Castle and put her in charge of the Plaza Hotel, which would base her in New York. He needed the coast to be clear. You know, I had been told that Donald was cheating on Ivana. And it never even entered my mind that that could possibly be true. And she was so trusting of Donald, and so into the fact that they were working together, that I don't think it ever crossed her mind. No matter what you get, there's never enough. And I think that that is the epitome of Donald, that he can never be satisfied. Oh, there's no question that it was 
a secret, but it was not a very well-kept secret in Atlantic City. I mean, let's face it, when the room service guy goes up to deliver dinner for two, <laughs> and Donald Trump is one of the people, you know, the secret doesn't last long. <laughs> No guy likes talking about affairs, by the way. <laughs> I just want to tell you. <laughs> I really liked Marla. She was absolutely charming. Very low-key, sweet little Georgia girl. I found her delightful. She also was very, very beautiful. She was a lot younger than Ivana. She was engaging, and she smiled. It was very rare to see a smile from Ivana. Ivana was a tough woman, and there was nothing tough about Marla Maples. Trump was strictly business. The only time we had any personal stuff was when he was uh, going out with Marla Maples, uh, slipping around, he was still married to Ivana. And I was, as they say, the beard. We called it the beard so that it would look like this individual was with Marla and not Donald. But Donald used a lot of us that way. We wound up comping all of her uh, services and stays and food, whatever it might be. He asked me if I would mind taking out Marla Maples. And so he sent a limo. I picked her up and we went to dinner. I love the fact that when we went into the restaurant, all the women looked at her like they would want her chopped up into little pieces and all the pieces burned. And we had a great dinner. We went out uh, to the limo, drove a couple of blocks, another limo pulled up and she got out and there was Donald in the other car. And I went home to my wife. I did one of the first interviews with Marla. She said, the thing is, you can't help who you fall in love with. And I really fell in love with this man. She was a very, very honest, lovely woman who didn't realize what she was getting into. Donald Trump believed that if he had three casinos in Atlantic City, he would be able to drive some of these other casinos out of business and dominate the city. And so he gets his hands on a third casino hotel. The Taj Mahal was a half-finished casino in Atlantic City with three acres of gaming space, basically the equivalent of two other casinos in town combined. Halfway through construction, they ran out of financing, and the property went dormant. It was not only the biggest, but the most expensive casino in the world. There was an extraordinary amount of work that needed to be done. So it wasn't a $100 million fix. This was going to be a billion-dollar project for Donald Trump. In November 1988, Donald Trump purchased the Taj Mahal project, and here we are today, requesting this commission issue a casino license and operation certificate to Donald J. Trump's Taj Mahal. When Donald bought the Taj Mahal, the Casino Control Commission was really interested in where the money was coming from and whether he had the money to really make this a viable operation. And so Donald said the bankers were waiting in line to write him a check. He actually believed that. All those in favor, motion carries unanimously. The investigators had a lot of concerns, but they did approve it. Trump was a major employer in New Jersey. So the Casino Control Commission have a powerful incentive not to create problems for a major local employer, no matter what damage might be caused by their financial practices. It's going to be tremendously successful. It's going to be great for Atlantic City. It's going to be great for everybody. Good luck, everybody. Thank you for being here. Oh, how much are we going to win the first year? By the end of the 80s, we're starting into a recession. For the third straight day, a selling avalanche hit Wall Street. Well, the Dow Jones index had gone down by over 100 points. The banks weren't waiting in line to lend him the money. He had to go out and use junk bond financing to do the deal. The difference between the junk bond financing and a conventional loan is really the cost of borrowing the money. He had to go out and borrow $675 million at an interest rate of 14%, which was just unheard of. So from the very first moment that you opened to make ends meet for this casino, he had to reap $1.3 million a day. A day. This was something no other casino in Atlantic City or Las Vegas had ever done. Once the Taj Mahal 
became Donald Trump's property. Steve Hyde was now in charge of all three properties. And I became the president at Trump Plaza. Donald had a great deal of respect for Steve's knowledge. And I think Donald also realized that Steve wasn't going to be competition for headlines. He was kind of shy. So it was a very good fit. And it appeared that Donald actually listened to Steve Hyde. Ten foot high letters are put in place, 42 stories above what will be the world's largest casino. The $1 billion Taj Mahal is expected to open next spring. The Taj was a massive project and Trump needed to get it open as quickly as possible because the longer it took him to develop the Taj, the less able he was to pay down the debt he incurred to build it in the first place. Well, on October 10th, 1989, we had a press conference scheduled in New York City for Vinnie Ponzienza, Hector Macho Camacho boxing match. It was scheduled on a date that I was on vacation. Steve and Mark were still gonna go up. I had asked John Beninov to go up in my place. When you work for Trump, you know you're working for the best. There's, I think it's human nature. When people say, where do you work? When you're working for the number one place, there's a lot of pride behind that. I woke up that morning my wife came and there was a look on her face that I'd never seen and she said, it's Steve, Mark, and John, or the helicopter they were on. She told me that it had crashed and that they had died. <laughs> the day those three guys died was the toughest day of my life. I'd never felt a greater sense of loss. Uh, you know, I guess they called survivor's guilt. I particularly felt it with John because I had asked him to go. Shortly after that, I got a phone call from Donald. He had this disbelief conversation. Can't believe this happened. There was shock. At Steve Hyde's funeral, he paused for an extensive amount of time looking at Steve's picture. And I do think he cried. This impacted him. He was deeply hurt for the friendship, but he was also deeply concerned about the business. The question now is, what will their shocking deaths mean to the Big Taj project? The three Trump executives who died were at the pinnacle of the casino industry and their losses being felt in Atlantic City. The void was clear at the top of the organization. And how he filled that void was he brought his brother Robert. He was going to shepherd the Taj Mahal through its opening. At one point I asked Robert why it took him so long to join. He was in his 40s. And he said, Alan, if you had a brother like Donald Trump, would you be so anxious just to work with him? Donald Trump was facing a very perilous moment. He wasn't experienced in running casinos, and at the time, he was having an affair with Marla Maples. There was a fear from a business standpoint that if and when this affair was going to blow up, where would it blow up? I certainly didn't want it to blow up at a press conference or any kind of public thing that we were doing. And quite frankly, I said, thank God for Aspen. It was the winter of 1989, and the family went down to Aspen as normal. Except he had arranged for Marla to fly down for the same exact week that he would be there with his children and wife and in-laws. She's splitting his time between the two of them somehow, but they're both in the same small community. There was one place where everyone stopped for lunch called Bonnie's. Marla, Ivana, and the children are there. I was talking to this girlfriend of mine who was an Aspen. She goes, oh my God, you're not going to believe what's happening. This woman has confronted Yvonne and pushed her and said, I want your husband. 
and the two of them are having a fight, and Ivana's crying. Ivana wanted to go back to New York right away. She didn't want to be there. She didn't want to be there with Marla. She was embarrassed. Ivana was totally devoted to their marriage, to their business, and to their life together. So she was devastated. I was in the Plaza Hotel at the time, and I went to see Ivana. And I didn't even get out my sense when she's, she burst into tears. I just, I was taken aback. I, I, I felt terrible for her. They didn't separate initially. They still went about business as usual. Trump had bigger things to worry about. The biggest casino he was ever going to oversee was about to open in Atlantic City. And it was so larded with debt that it was uncertain whether or not that could be a success. In 1990, as the date is coming, the Wall Street Journal wrote a report. What about the Taj Mahal? And in it, they quoted a very well-known and respected casino analyst by the name of Marvin Rothman. My job was to go out and evaluate situations to see if they're good investments or risky investments. I was quoted in the article as saying that the Taj would open to record-breaking business, but when the cold came, it wouldn't make it. Donald Trump sent a fax to the CEO of our company. He wanted a public apology or an immediate dismissal, or he would institute a major lawsuit against the firm. My boss came to me and said, we're going to call Donald Trump on the telephone. And Trump said, Marvin, the first thing you're going to do is call the Wall Street Journal. And you're going to tell them that that son of a biscuit reporter misquoted you. And then you're going to write me a paper stating that the Taj Mahal is going to be the greatest success ever. I told my boss that I can't write a paper like this. There's no way in the world that they're going to be able to make their interest payment. So I went back to my office, and shortly thereafter, my boss brings the letter. He said, can you live with this? It said, dear Mr. Trump, I apologize for my comments, and when this property opens, I'm sure it's going to be a big success and all this stuff. I was under incredible stress because I really liked my job, and I had been there 17 years. So I signed the letter. I didn't sleep that night. The very next morning, I came into the office and I wrote a letter and I said, Dear Donald, uh, the letter that was sent to you was never written by me. And I would direct that you not use this letter for any purpose whatsoever. I sent the letter out and they immediately fired me. huge crowd for the opening. People wanted to see what this was like. It had gotten a lot of attention in the press. It was opening day in Atlantic City. Donald Trump's billion dollar Taj Mahal Casino opens its doors. On the outside, it all looked great. There really was an enormous turnout for this opening. But behind the scenes, things were not going well. At one point, I was in the back area, and there was a, a door on the other side of a hallway. I said, I'm curious what's in there. 
and I got blank stares and nobody knew. And we opened up the steel doors and it was full of coin they didn't even know that was in there. Two million dollars that nobody knew even existed. <laughs> it was that bad. <laughs> July was a poor month in Atlantic City overall, despite the opening of the lavish Taj Mahal in the spring. We're now fully into a recession. People thought that desperate people will still go gambling, but in fact, revenues were down at all the casinos. It turned out that Marvin was absolutely on the mark with everything that he said. I thought it was an easy call. How all these people got enticed into this, it, this is something I cannot understand. Donald's debts are piling up. He was having trouble paying all of his bills. Of course, Donald, you know, he had to blame somebody. He wasn't going to step up and say, oh, I borrowed money at 14%. Nine months later, in an interview in the New York Times, Trump attacked the three dead men, blaming many of his financial problems in Atlantic City on their mismanagement. I said, Donald, you can't do this. First off, it's not true. But second, you're blaming people who died. Quite frankly, they died working for you. Ultimately, this is what caused the breakup between myself and Donald Trump. By 1990, Donald is in trouble on every front. And it was this moment in his personal life where everything falls apart. When Donald and Ivana returned from Aspen to New York, there was a period of a month and a half or so where Ivana was just in shock. Her whole world had just exploded. And finally, she filed for divorce. Here comes the war of the Trumps. Ivana and the Donald are calling it quits. This was the tabloid sex scandal of the 1990s. It was on the front page of the papers for 28 days. Trump, 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 Trump. I never saw anything like it in my life. Ivana was leaking to the New York Daily News, and Trump was leaking to the New York Post. It was a divorce in the tabloid. Over her dead body. Give me the plaza. Best sex I've ever had. This is the best one. Ivana better deal. It had sex, it had beauty, it had bazillions of bucks, and it had a disgruntled ex-wife, and it had a innocent new girlfriend. It had everything you would sex, love, and rock and roll. Well, no rock and roll, but... The guy who penned the art of the deal has been less than artful with this personal deal. His first concern has been telling the world that the wife he put in charge of the plaza was in charge in name only. He began to denigrate Ivana and her performance, saying that she wasn't doing a good job, that he was going to get rid of her. I felt terrible for her. I mean, I knew he was giving her a hard time because I saw it. So I could imagine what he must have been like at home if I saw what he was like on the job. She was wearing out. She was not looking good, and it was, it was very tough, very tough on her. He would make the most extraordinarily horrible comments about the mother of his children. Barbara Walters took him to task on the air about it. The author Marie Brenner quotes you as saying to her, when a man leaves a woman, especially when it was perceived that he has left for a piece of ass, a good one, there are 50% of the population who will love the woman who has left. I do remember saying that. I don't remember having used those words. It's possible, but I believe that if a man leaves a woman for almost any reason, that that particular person, the man, is going to be at a major disadvantage in terms of the public eye. There's no question about it. I felt so sorry for Ivana. And don't forget, the kids were young, but they weren't that young, so they knew what was going on. Donnie Jr. was so upset, didn't speak to him for two years. It's hard to make the case that Donald was right in this situation. Is it true about that? Do you wish we'd all go away? Absolutely. Oh, Ivana, she was quite a popular figure around town. She was a mother. Uh, and she was kind of uh, clearly been shamed by another woman. 
And because of her integrity, the way she handled Donald, the way that she handled the children, she became so well respected. Fred and his wife were very saddened and disturbed by the dissolution of, of Trump's marriage. He really liked Ivana and he loved his grandchildren. A new kind of aura developed around Trump of being a very disreputable guy, really, instead of a shabby guy who cheated on his wife and who had incurred a lot of debt. For Donald Trump, there's nothing worse than being a laughing stock. It's something that has always brought out the most aggressive aspects of his personality. Every morning, he was given a folder full of the clippings from the newspapers about him, any mention of him, and he raged at any negative coverage or any criticism that he got. He became very, very aggressive towards journalists he felt had not given him the right coverage. Then gradually, things got out of control. One day, the executive producer came to me and said, we've got an interview with Donald Trump. You became very public, very clearly, by your own design. I don't know if it was by my own design. You mean the publicity? I do developments which get a lot of publicity. I mean, if, tr oh, if I didn't do Trump, I mean this. I mean, there's no reason to expose yourself to millions of people. There's but no... you know why you do it? Why? You me. love the publicity. Oh, I hate the publicity. Oh, come on, get oh, out no, of here. I'm telling you, I hate the publicity. Oh, please. I hate it. Gradually, he began to lose control of his own narrative, which made him very, very angry. He was so thin-skinned that he couldn't take it. I don't think it was fun for him anymore. And I think it drove him very dark. In 1991, I decided that it was time to kind of do the very reported piece on, on what was really going on in the Trump empire. We assigned Marie Brenner to it. It was very explosive because not only did she talk about his business reverses in a very candid way, but she also described the whole kind of fakery of the Trump world. We had his brother Robert quoted saying, Donald was the kid at the birthday party who threw cake. He always wanted the attention, he didn't care how he got it. He was the one trashing everybody else if he didn't get what he wanted. Trump was very angry and felt that he'd been sort of betrayed. So about five or six months later, Marie Brenner was attending a benefit. I think it was a black tie dinner. She's sitting there with the strapless, backless in her back. She suddenly felt something sort of down her back, something sort of cold and wet. And she turns and she sees Donald Trump walking away with an empty glass in his hand. He had poured wine down her back as a way of getting even for the piece she wrote about him. And <laughs> it was just unbelievable. Normally, when a reporter writes a story, if the source and the subject disagrees with it, there is a civil discourse. In my case, a glass of wine was poured down my back. Seems just yesterday, the big news magazines were running cover stories about his astonishing financial success. The headlines are screaming, death of a legend, and calling him the has-been of high finance. See, Donald is short of cash. By 1990, Trump's entire empire was, quote, in severe financial distress. Donald's financial troubles became so massive, ultimately, that Fred had to help bail him out. Nobody ever bailed out Fred Trump in the way that he bailed out his own son. Even Donald's father has helped out. A $3 million purchase of chips in one of his son's casinos went toward paying interest to bondholders. His father sent his lawyer down to Atlantic City to buy a couple million dollars worth of chips to give him some cash in order to meet his obligations. Trump is going down to the wire with his empire in danger of toppling. He has to come up with millions of dollars by tomorrow or an uncontrollable chain of events could be set in motion. He was facing a midnight deadline to make payments. The midnight deadline came and went. And all of the lawyers representing the companies and banks, they were all gathered at the bankruptcy lawyer's office in Manhattan. Trump is at home in Trump Tower, and he gets a call summoning him at this meeting in the middle of the night, and he gets in the limo and rushes over, and this is it. I mean, this is potentially the end of the Trump empire. 
If he failed, he would be given over to the bank, including properties that Fred had developed. So Trump was staring at destroying not only his own legacy, but his father's legacy as well. In what could be his final roll of the dice, the Donald met late into the night with creditors who want to shut down his Taj Mahal casino and get their money back. He was frightened. He was terrified of losing everything he had acquired. A signal moment was when a bank told him that unless he made good on the payments on his yacht, they were gonna take the yacht away from him. Trump decided, okay, let's just tell them they can have the yacht. And the bank came back to them and said, well, wait a minute, we don't wanna own a yacht. We really don't wanna deal with this. And that's when a light went off in Trump's head. He realized that he was too big to fail. Trump's biggest creditors have come up with a temporary agreement he's been put on a personal allowance. He'll have to scrape by on $450,000 a month. He's put on an allowance, and most of his biggest toys are taken away from him. The airline, the Plaza Hotel, all except Mar-a-Lago and his triplex in Trump Tower. As for today's events, Donald Trump says he made a great deal, a fantastic deal, that his empire is intact and he's running it. During the course of that summer, it was Trump's 44th birthday, he announced a big bash for himself in Atlantic City. How is the morale these days with all the news about the financial problem? It's what the newspapers are doing to us, and we've got to turn that around. But, you know, who doesn't bounce a check? You know, everyone has little financial problems every now and then. Happy birthday, Donald. At the time of this birthday party, he must know he has no hope of making a success. He's telling the public there's no doubt it will be successful. The Taj Mahal set a record, an all-time record. Nobody wants to write about it. They want to write the negatives, not the positives. And that's okay. Over the years, I've surprised a lot of people. The biggest surprise is yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. The restructuring of Donald Trump's debts only delayed the inevitable. In 1991, within less than a year, the Taj would go bankrupt. The castle and the plaza both also go into bankruptcy protection. There's an operating bankruptcy that Trump took advantage of, which allowed him to keep the doors of the casinos open while he worked out the debt. At last, they are Mr. and Mrs. Trump came down the long staircase of the Plaza Hotel this evening after tying the knot in front of about 1,000 guests. Donald's marriage to Morla took place at the Plaza Hotel, which he owned at the time. I guess he got a good deal on the catering. I don't know. It was an over-the-top extravaganza. I think it's an exciting event. I am uh, certainly never near anything that reeks of society. It's kind of a royal wedding in New York, isn't it? It was lovely, she looked beautiful. It was just a big, giant party. He's now on his second marriage, but he's still got financial problems. There were certainly plenty of developers at that time who basically went into bankruptcy uh, and were left with nothing. Trump was very close to joining that club of great wealthy people who had lost everything. What he and his bankers come up with is the idea of creating a public company. Donald Trump is gambling. Investors want to bet on him again. We're really happy. This is a very exciting day. When a company comes public, you're offering investors a stake in your company in return for their cash. For those interested in following the stock, Trump made it characteristically easy. It trades under the symbol of DJT. Donald J. Trump. The shares opened at $14 a share. It rose to $32 a share. People believed in Donald. They had confidence that Donald could be uh, the catalyst uh, for success. Going public can be like hitting the jackpot. The drawer of the cash register opens, and suddenly there's a lot more cash that you can grab and put to users. 
he created a public company to buy the Trump assets. In other words, to buy the Trump casinos. This allowed Trump to get out from beneath the weight of a lot of debt that he otherwise would have had to repay himself personally. Trump's not left holding the bag because he's already sold this public company, his over-leveraged junky assets for more than it's worth, cashed out of some stock. So when the stock goes down and goes bust, individual investors who bought stock in his public company in Atlantic City just completely lost their shirt. Things went so poorly that the share price went from about $35 to 17 cents. This is an extraordinary failure. How do you feel as a bond owner? Uh, pretty bad. I was pretty bad about it. It was it's unbelievable. With his name and everything, I would have had a good investment. That was, in effect, the most profitable idea Trump ever had because he put himself into deals in which he could not really lose money. He could only make money. To have one business failure after another and still walk away with millions, uh, it's uh, extraordinarily rare. The upside will take care of itself. It's a downside you have to take care of. Ben Hogan, uh, the golfer, he said, it's not about who hits the most good shots. It's about who hits the best bad shots, meaning it's the guy who hits the bad shots that work, that win. The winner in Donald Trump's Atlantic City empire was Donald Trump. The stockholders were losers, and also the vendors that were unpaid for the work that they did. It is a private meeting to find out how we're going to collect our money. How much money is to be collected? For us, 1.2 million. And for all the contractors? I don't know that figure. It's in excess of 60 million. I do not know the exact figure. My contractor was for glass and glazing, storefronts, mirrors. What they were looking for was a grand piano with a computer built in that would play by itself. I took to my lawyer and I said, you know, we have about $100,000 involved in this. Do I need to, to put a lien on the property? He laughed at me and he said, you're doing business with Donald Trump. He has lots of money. The 90 days came and I still hadn't been paid. So I gave him a call. Oh, we'll take care of it. You know, we got a few other bills to take care of and you know, oh, don't worry about it. We had to lay off a substantial amount of men. We wound up using our credit lines to pay our supplier. Finally, I got a letter from the Taj Mahal. So he said, you can accept 70% on a dollar, or you can wait till the casino makes enough money on its own to pay it in full, or you can put us in a bankruptcy and get maybe 10 cents on a dollar. A lot of these small contractors went under. From Trump's viewpoint, it was all about his survival. If that meant that certain people were shortchanged, that was okay with Trump because he won. I was in a room with a group of people and a friend of mine was in, and they were talking about me. Well, Trump didn't do so well in Atlantic City. The other guy said, Trump made a fortune. Are you crazy? Call the money out, he bought property all over the fucking world. And you're saying he didn't make money? Then he bankrupted it three times, and every time he bankrupted in fact, people are amazed, because every time he bankrupted it, came back more, more, more. Because I know how to use the system. Marla was someone who didn't fit in Donald's world. As a result, she was almost an in-between figure in his life, and they were not married for very long. When they divorced, she too was the victim of a prenuptial agreement that made life a little harder than it should have been for the divorced wife of a man who claimed to be a billionaire. He's always gonna be fine, he's just gotta win. <laughs> His marriage to Marla Maples was ending. He had gone through bankruptcies, his father, Fred Trump, had been sick for many years. It was one of the lowest moments of his life.
Donald and his father had a tough relationship through the years. Fred Trump was often dismissive of Donald's ventures, especially early on. He thought that he was taking on way more than he could chew. He was very critical of Donald for going into debt. I didn't like the whole idea of building an empire based on debt. And yet in later years, uh, Fred Trump showed considerable pride in what his son had achieved. You can't overestimate the impact that Fred Trump has had on the life and imagination of his son, Donald. Donald grew up intimidated by his father, enamored of his father, deeply respectful of his father. One of the only photographs that travels with Trump from New York to Washington is a black and white photo of Fred Trump. Fred Trump looms very, very large in Donald Trump's history. At the time that his father died, Donald was no longer able to borrow money from banks to put up a project. His divorce from Marla, his failures in other businesses, he was not the fair-haired boy that he had been uh, when he was building Trump Tower. He was in a, a steady decline, maybe four or five billion dollars of corporate debt. The myth was broken. Newspapers were now going after him instead of just doing press releases on him. That was very bad. His casinos had failed. They'd gone into bankruptcy. At that point, he was fading into just another New York developer that nobody cared about. Who will be the apprentice? It was the American dream on TV. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. He's now going to try to trade on a new version of his character, which is that he's a survivor. I think you'll like it. Before you knew it, it was Trump soap, and it was Trump this, and it was Trump that. Live like Trump, be like Trump, make a comeback like Trump. WrestleMania was a crucial stepping stone on Donald Trump's path to the Oval Office. Donald Trump's gone through five bankruptcies. He's certainly persona non grata in New York and the United States. So where does he go? I know the Russians better than anybody. So many apartments to Russia. Donald Trump wasn't going to do new ones. Our current president came out of nowhere. No one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. Donald Trump wants to win at everything he does. Politics will never be the same. There has been nothing like this before. <laughs> This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. His presidency and the lead up to his presidency will be studied for the rest of American history. Donald Trump is a street fighter. When you think of how he started in 2015, he understood where America was going to some degree before America did. Over the years, I've surprised a lot of people. The biggest surprise is yet to come. I used to think that Donald Trump really understood the zeitgeist of the nation. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Now I realized he is the zeitgeist. There was virtually not a person on the planet who didn't know who Donald Trump was. To listen to this, it's just so ridiculous. There's a toughness to him. I mean, he can take a lot of bullets. He can catch bullets in his teeth. Donald Trump is a survivor. He comes as advertised. It can be disgusting, but there is a genius to it. I don't think people change. I'm a very big believer in the fact that when you are a certain way, that's the way you are. I love to fight. I always love to fight. My father was a very tough man. Try and blow all the candles out with one breath, okay? Okay. Whenever you're ready. There's a clear through line that's passed down from generation to generation. If you become a power broker in Manhattan, you are the man. Trump, 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 Trump. His name is his power. 
do whatever you have to do, you say whatever you have to say. Winning is everything. I think that to understand Donald Trump, you really have to go back to the beginning. Topping out, right? This is called topping out. All right, this see how much out. I know? Listen, about a handshake. Sure. Good. They can live in Houston, they can live in Paris, they can live anywhere in the world. Many of these very wealthy people have chosen Trump Tower, and I think it's a very important step for New York. I think it's a vital step for New York. Trump Tower is nothing if not a symbol that winning is everything. Trump Tower was really the thing that put him on the map in so many ways. It won him recognition and even honor and brought him to a level that he thought had not been possible for his family to date. He, by the way, uh, he is a chip off the old block. This my, is my uh, father, Fred. Right. He was able to surpass his very demanding father, leaving behind Brooklyn and Queens and taking over New York. But this was not the beginning. The Trump family saga starts much earlier on. All right, so you know I'm trying to march you through your life. I'm not in the past. I'm, yeah. I'm a person that thinks to the future. Well, that's, that's the thing is... I just don't like wasting time on the past. <laughs> Other people do have to know about how you got here. I'm never in the past. <laughs> right, I know, right, I know. I know. It's hard in 2014, in yeah, I did four sit-down interviews with Donald Trump. I wanted to know, how was it that this kid from Queens turned himself into the character that became the Donald Trump we know? Well, let me see if I can... I don't like talking about the past. The past is over. No, I don't want to think about it. I don't like to think too much of the past. All right, well, other look, than, other than, this is very important. I learned from the past. Donald's grandfather, Friedrich Trump, came to the United States in 1885. He was 16. He came from a wine-producing small village in Germany, but wasn't content to stay there. In the middle of the night, he writes a letter and leaves it for his mom, and in the morning, he's gone. For Friedrich, the goal was to really become a wealthy man. Railroads are advertising every day, buy a ticket to Fortune, buy a ticket west. Friedrich took off for the Northwest the last part of the physical frontier where things were wide open and a young man with a lot of energy might be able to do very well. Word began to circulate of a mining town just getting going northeast of Seattle called Monte Cristo, being bankrolled of all things by John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller is, of course, this living emblem of success in America. And so if John D. Rockefeller says, my engineers have discovered there's this great vein of silver ore, well, off you go. All you had to do to stake a claim was declare that you had struck silver on a piece of land and it was yours to work and no one else could have it. In Friedrich's case, he announced that he had found something when he hadn't even dug a single hole. He had no intention of mining, and he, in fact, instead, built a hotel. 
He looked at the world that he had come into and figured out where there was an opening and figured out how to do it. He was very savvy about that. He set himself up to mine the miners, providing food, fine dining, and... There is a wonderful euphemism called rooms for ladies. Pretty much of a code word for prostitutes. There were prostitutes hanging out in the bar, and uh, any man who wanted to take a hookup upstairs, there were rooms available. Friedrich was supremely ambitious, was willing to do whatever it took in order to get ahead. In 1897, a ship came in to Seattle laden with gold from the gold fields of the Yukon. These men stagger off onto dry land, but they can barely walk down the gangplank because of their sacks and bags of gold. And that set off the Yukon gold rush. Friedrich thought, I want a share of the action. Friedrich makes his way to the Yukon. Like everybody else, it's by foot. It's an astonishing journey up mountain passes, single file. It was an extremely arduous, difficult, life-threatening situation. The White Pass Trail, you could have horses on it, and horses could pull the loads over. But these miners had no idea what that, in fact, involved. The horses were completely unsuitable for their absolutely grim conditions. And they died on the trail, or they fell and broke their legs, or their owners simply shot them because they couldn't go any further. There was a terrifying piece of that trail called the Dead Horse Gulch, which was packed solid with dead horse flesh. In fact, one of the miners who went up that trail said that you could have just laid all the horses end to end and you would have been walking over dead horse flesh for 50 miles. But for Friedrich, it was an opportunity. He had tent restaurants along the way. And where would you get fresh meat? What do these people need? They need food. So he uses those dead horses and serves up horse burgers, serves up horse steaks. Friedrich arrives in Bennett with all of his guile and all of his resourcefulness intact, and he's ready to go into business. Bennett was a newly built town that was thrown up by people on the way to the gold fields. Bennett was a very savvy place to be because all the miners had to come through Bennett. So he, there was always going to be traffic. He establishes himself, builds his hotel restaurant. It's filled, it's bustling, and apparently the best restaurant in town. That's what the press account said. But he hears there's a railway being built to a place further down the river called Whitehorse, which at that stage was barely more than a couple of buildings. Friedrich notes that Bennett will be bypassed. Now, what's his response to this? It is to put his restaurant and hotel on a raft and float it down the river to Whitehorse. By the time the train arrived there, he had a restaurant and a hotel there. Of course, that means that he's in on the ground floor and makes a fortune really fast. I don't think, given Friedrich's character, anything else is going to happen. This is a guy of consummate ambition. And he must have led a wildlife, because you can imagine. Right. He, he owned one little hotel, and he moved the hotel. He'd take it down. <laughs> oh, right? yeah. And floated on a barge. And floated on a barge, and then moved it to a better Stunning. area. And, and he served more than food. Right, 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 right. You, know, you can no. satisfy right. all your appetites. He must have led some wildlife. <laughs> yeah. Booze, beds, and women. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but he got rich. Yeah, but he did well. Yeah. And yeah. He, was, he was a great guy, from what I hear. I mean, he, was, he was, must have been terrific. 
in his early 30s, Friedrich goes back to Germany and he has a few things on his mind. One is to find a wife. He's looking for a lovely German woman to marry and he discovers Elizabeth Christ. The two fall in love and were eventually married. In 1905, they returned to New York. She's carrying her son, Donald's father, Frederick. Friedrich is not going to operate a saloon slash restaurant slash house of ill repute. He's going to become a businessman and his business is going to be real estate. Friedrich is looking out on the world that is New York City and searching for a frontier. Just as there was a railroad being built to Whitehorse in the Yukon, he sees that the place to be is Queens. The frontier is going to be reached by the Queensboro Bridge. This is a mighty edifice that is going to literally open up to the crush of people interested in the suburbs. The people need homes, and he decides it's a wonderful opportunity for the real estate man on the make. In the spring of 1918, young Fred, Donald's father, is 12 years old. He went out for a walk with his father. As they're walking along, his father says he's not feeling well. And within hours, he's died. Eventually, it becomes clear that what's killed him was the influenza epidemic that's sweeping the country in 1918 and has claimed millions of lives. You can imagine the sense of siege and worry about how you were gonna survive. Fred, he was the oldest son, and as the oldest son, he had to step into this role and take care of things. Of course, their lives were drastically changed. Fred Trump Sr.'s experience was in some ways a classic uh, borough-ethnic uh, story. His childhood was foreshortened. So he worked hard, and that kind of an upbringing can make you, or can break you. It made him. My father was the greatest, because he taught me everything. He was very knowledgeable. He was a very smart guy. He was a very good negotiator. And he taught me a lot. I learned a lot from my father, from Fred. At the age of 17, Fred built his first home. He took the profits from that to build another, and the profits from that for another, and pretty soon the family business was taking off. At the height of the Depression, 1934, with a good deal of homelessness, the federal government is trying to address this issue by creating the Federal Housing Administration. The Congress has made it easier for private capital to build modest homes and low rental dwellings. By seeding all this money, by backing all these loans, the FHA creates this whirlwind of development. This was the beginning of the Trump empire. The FHA would be responsible for the funding of some of Fred's biggest projects. Without the FHA, there is no Fred Trump. From the beginning of the FHA until the end of the 1930s, he built thousands of homes. He was touted as the Henry Ford of home building at one point. Because he had figured out how to do this as economically as possible. Donald Trump grew up in a part of Queens called Jamaica Estates which is not what we generally think of when we think of the boroughs of New York City. Donald's house, the first time I saw it in Jamaica Estates, was huge. It had six giant white two-story pillars and had an under-the-house garage. 23 rooms and even a kind of coat of arms over the door. I was incredibly blown away. Today, I could say it was a mega mansion.
Donald Trump is the middle of three boys in a family of five children. And his older brother, Freddie, was kind of his hero. He was the sibling that Donald Trump looked up to the most. He was such an amazing guy. And the best personality, best looking guy you'll ever see. He was smart. He had everything, but he was a very handsome guy. He was a guy with great sense of humor. Always fun to be around. We went to the Trump house often, but we never went through the front door. We always went through the garage because Mr. Trump would rather not have us around. I think he just thought that uh, Fred was wasting his time with friends and should be doing more serious things. In the 1950s, the Trumps are one of the wealthiest families in America. Fred Sr. set the standards, set the expectations, and they were very high. This was not a let's go out in the backyard and play catch kind of dad. This was a do as I say, tough, old fashioned father. Donald Trump was taught that life is a competition. You must win, you must be tough. Fred Trump saw the world as one of winners and losers, a very binary approach to life. And he impressed upon his children the idea that they simply had to be winners. His father was a brutal man. I think that Donald got used to being treated in a totally business-like and transactional way. He himself describes the relationship with his father as business-like. To the boys, he says, you are killers and you are kings. Fred means kings by divine right. There is a sense in the Trump family that we are genetically superior. I think you have a natural ability at things. I'm a big believer in, in nature. No, I'm a, not nature. I'm a big believer in natural ability. Genetically, some people can handle pressure better than others. I knew numerous people that committed suicide. So the one thing I learned about myself uh, is that I have a very unique ability to handle pressure. Honestly? In my opinion, that's a genetic thing. People don't know about me, I have very low blood pressure. You know, I have the blood pressure of a great athlete. Hmm. I have very low blood pressure. There is a real belief that Trumps are destined to rule. And they got the message. And the message was that you were supposed to prevail at all costs. Fred Trump Jr. would talk about wanting to go into the family business because of his admiration for his father. And it was very, very clear that he wanted to be the next head of the company. Donald was not the young man destined to fulfill the job of running the Trump Organization. But he refused to be ignored. He was the kid that the family had to pay attention to, only because it was an enormous discipline problem. Donald and I were cut-ups in school. We used to throw spitballs at each other and play bumper chairs in class, pull girls' hair. And that's how come we got detentions, which I politely nicknamed as DTs, detentions for Donnie Trump. He was someone who uh, acted out at school. Birthday parties, he would grab the cake and throw it around. He was angry. He would glue his brothers' and sisters' blocks together. He was disliked by many of his teachers. Threw erasers around, actually hit his teacher under the eye with one. He took pride in being uh, this tough guy who would push back against other kids or against teachers who were trying to tell him what to do. He was, in short, a terror. I was a very um, rebellious kind of person. I don't like to talk about it, actually, but I was a very rebellious person and a very um, set in my ways. I don't like that guy. I love to fight. I always love to fight. All types of fights. Any kind of fight I loved, it, including physical. And I was always the best athlete, Some, something that nobody knew about me. Okay, sign up, Paul. 
During this period, West Side Story was big on Broadway and was soon to become a movie. Hold it! The sharks and the jets were in the imaginations of kids in New York City. As Donald tells the story, after he had seen West Side Story, he and his buddy bought themselves some switchblades. Donald wants everyone to believe that he's a tough guy. He promoted this image of himself. I'm gonna play with knives. I'm gonna do things that nobody else does. He was impossible to control. Then his dad found the switchblades, and that was the last straw. Fred Trump was a man who kept score. He kept score every time the school called, every time a letter came home, every time he found something, the knife collection that Donald acquires. He saw it as a reflection on him. Something must be done about it. And his solution was going to be extreme. At the end of seventh grade, I went away to camp. Donald went away to do whatever Donald did. And when I came back in September with all my friends, I noticed a seat in homeroom that was not occupied where Donald usually sat. And I asked the homeroom teacher, where's Donnie? Against his will, Donald Trump is sent to military school by his father. In 1959, he arrives at New York Military Academy about an hour north of New York City. He's 13 years old. I think that had to be the most miserable existence Donald Trump could imagine for himself. He has to wear a uniform. He no longer is driven around by the family chauffeur. He is in the dorms with everyone else in the barracks. When I got here, it was Hello, good morning, now you're in military school and your life has changed. All these normal things that go on in a normal kid's life, they came to a screeching halt. Your first year, you were the low man on the totem pole and you were responsible for learning new guy rules. There was mental hazing, there was physical hazing. You had to throw yourself against a wall if an upperclassman came by and you know apologize for being in his way. You might get a, a, a forearm to the chest you might get paddled, you might get hit with a broomstick, a couple of right hooks on your shoulder, two or three upperclassmen screaming in your face for 15 minutes. Before you know it, you're beat up. Donald went through new guy rules with Major Ted DeBias. This is a tough guy. He was part of the Allied invasion of Italy, and at the end of the war saw Mussolini swinging from a noose. They used to come here they were flunkies, they call them flunkies. Uh, and they grew up to be somebody. Donald ran up against Major Tobias, like running into a stone wall. It's not flexible. And if Major Tobias would see an attitude, that attitude ended very, very quickly. He was a rough guy, physically rough and mentally rough. And those days, it smacked the hell out of you. Really getting in your face. I mean, like, big league. He said things like, stand up. And I went, <laughs> give me a fucking break. <laughs> and this guy came at me. You would never believe it. These were guys that didn't take shit. You can go two ways. You can fight the system. You're not going to win, because you're not going to beat guys like this or you can acclimate and deal with the system and evolve in the system. And I did that. Theodore DeBias was a taskmaster far beyond anything that Donald had seen from Fred Trump. And yet he kind of takes to it. He liked the discipline, he enjoys the hierarchy. He didn't like being bossed around, he never had, but he liked the idea that the kids who were on the receiving end of all of that aggression would, in fairly short order, get to deliver it themselves. For Donald, the idea was to play the game and win the game, turn around and set the terms yourself. He literally 
bowed and scraped before Ted Tobias in order to win his favor, and he discovered that it worked. It was Donald who wound up an officer. Now, I went in there as a wise guy. You were little. You were 13 years old. 13. But I went in as a wise guy that was a little difficult. By the time I graduated, I was like top of the military heap. Every year, we would send a certain number of cadets down to New York to march in the Columbus Day Parade. So in Columbus Day 1963, Donald Trump led the parade. In Trump's mind, this return to the city and having clearly a position of authority, this is a bit of a retort to his father and a, a chance to say to his father, look what I've become. And you thought that you needed to send me away because I wasn't heading down the right road. Look what I've become. Look what I can do. Look how I can lead. Look how I can be that winner that you demanded. It was a way of taking that step into Manhattan, of going where his father would not go. And he was determined to show that he could take the family and its legacy to a new, tougher, higher place. One of the tactical officers at the time was a man named Colonel Anthony Bass Castellano. As they were walking up the street, Donald looked over and he goes, you know, Ace, I'd really like to own some of this property someday. My father was a very good builder, mm -hmm. and he really did a good job. He would build a building, and next door they'd build a building. And my father's houses were better, and he'd build them cheaper. So he'd spend less money building a better house, and he'd sell it for more. In the mid-1960s, Fred Trump starts to think at this point about moving beyond more modestly sized projects and build on a scale unlike anything Fred Trump has built before, named Trump Village. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Trump Village, a middle income co op in Coney Island housing 2,800 families. What time is it on? Trump Village Apartments. How do you get in here? Oh, oh, oh. Is it worth waiting? Yes, my mother lives in a terrible apartment. They say it would take six or seven years, or maybe eight. Well, I'll take the chance. This is a project that ends up being far greater in scope than anything he's done before. His previous projects, the buildings were at most five, six stories. And here, he really sets his sights much higher, literally. And it's also the first time that Fred Trump labels a project clearly with the family name. Trump Village would emerge as one of Fred Trump's greatest public successes, but ironically, it also was going to be the source of one of his greatest public humiliations. In 1966, New York State began probing into what was going on at Trump Village. Fred Trump is hauled in for questioning for misusing funds, overbilling the government for equipment for services related to Trump Village. It includes him charging the state about $8,000 a piece for tile scrapers that normally cost $500. More glaringly, he overcharges the state for about $6.6 .6 million in fees the net result is it's very clear Fred Trump is gouging the state of New York and New York residents to line his own pockets. One of the commissioners finally says, is there any way we can prevent someone like this from ever getting a state contract again? Here he is, the patriarch of the family somebody they looked up to, to have him being publicly called out like that was extremely embarrassing to them. Neighbors, schoolmates, people were asking questions that they were seen as unpatriotic, possibly criminal. The 1966 
state investigation really had a, I would say, a devastating impact on Fred Trump. Trump Village really becomes the last significant project that he builds. Fred spent three decades building his company, and he was now looking for an heir who he felt was worthy of inheriting that mantle and moving the company forward. But when Donald graduates from college, the expectation is that he's going to join the family business to work first for his father, and then eventually for his brother Fred, who's considered the heir apparent. I think that what Fred expected of Fred Jr was something that it was, it was almost a, um, a classical king's approach to raising sons. If this son is worthy of me, he can rise to the throne. Uh, not every son is going to thrive in that kind of environment. There was a nervous quality about Fred. He was always on. I wondered in retrospect whether some of his anxiety was uh, caused by the constant pressure of trying to please his father. The point of no return in his relationship with his father was the attempted development of property in Coney Island. I remember Steeplechase vividly. It had a, a face with a big smile, with lots of teeth showing. It was a happy place. It was a playground, and it was a reminder that Coney Island was this haven for people in New York. Off the subways came streaming a million people on a weekend. A million people coming to Coney Island, and many of them were coming to sleep with chase. By the 60s, Coney Island is in decline. So Fred Trump buys steeplechase very quickly, largely under the radar of the folks in Coney Island. He wants to build housing there. Problem is, Fred Trump fails to get the necessary zoning change that would enable him to build this housing. The business community in Coney Island is desperate to have Steeplechase preserved. Fred Trump knew that if it got landmarked, uh, there was nothing much more he could do with this site. Fred got Fred Jr. involved in accelerating their demolition of this property before they had permission to build on it. Fred Jr. is trying his hardest to work with his father to demonstrate that he's as tough and as smart as his father. So Fred Trump organizes a wrecking party of sorts to celebrate the development of apartments along the seashore and the success of the Trump Organization. He invites all these people to come and basically hurl bricks through the great glass windows, through the enormous painting on the glass of the great smiling face of Steeplechase. And the thought that you would encourage people to throw bricks to destroy that smile, that face, that was such an integral part of growing up in Coney Island. I mean, it's unbelievable. In the end, it was a public relations nightmare for the Trumps. Fred Jr. could never do the political work and the other logistical work that was required to make the development real. And the property, even today, is not the site of any housing. And after the fiasco at Steeplechase, it was clear to all of the Trumps that Fred Jr. was not going to fulfill his father's expectations. Early in life, Donald looked up to Fred Jr. as the big brother. He was a very charming, very caring young man. And yet, Donald became very competitive with Fred Jr. and really showed him no mercy. If I were going to make a movie of this, I would see a younger brother trying to get primacy in a family. This became an increasingly terrible situation. Fred Trump would belittle Fred Jr. in meetings. He would sadistically attack him, saying, what do you know? In 
In the early 1970s, Fred Sr. takes the fateful move. He makes Donald president of the Trump Organization. What Fred Sr. is communicating here is unmistakable. Donald has made it. He is the future. Fred Jr. has not made it, and he's never going to make it. He had talked so much about working for his dad and taking over the company. Well, I think that the father, at some point, decided that Fred was a loser. I've got to believe that uh, uh, Fred took that rejection very hard. Fred essentially drove his son, Fred Jr., out of the family. And I think Fred ended up a, a lost soul. He had his own dream, to be a commercial airline pilot. In the end, Fred left the Trump Organization and went off to train as a pilot. He was having a tremendous hard time. And he started drinking and he got hooked on alcohol. And he became a very serious alcoholic. And it was rough for him. I've thought uh, long and hard about Fred's life and uh, wonder how much of a role that uh, rejection from his father may have played in his, in his sad life. I like to learn from other people's mistakes. I like to learn from my mistakes, but I like to learn more from other people's mistakes. Because why should I have to make a mistake if I can learn from somebody else? I've learned so many lessons by watching other people make mistakes, some fatal and some not fatal, and some not even near fatal. But I study other people's mistakes. Fred Jr. did not do much of anything the way that his father expected. His whole approach to life was contrary to the old man's. And Donald observed Fred Sr.'s impatience with Fred Jr. It's identified by him as a sign of Fred's weakness. Donald's takeaway from this is that it's an example of what he should never do in his own life. And he sees, here is this big opportunity for me that my brother squandered. When I was growing up, the signs on the Bell Parkway didn't say to Manhattan, they said to New York City. So you had a very strong sense that Manhattan was New York City and you were not, you were in the outer boroughs. You grew up with this chip on your shoulder. The city so nice, they had to name it twice. Well, New York, New York is Manhattan. It's the lake in the park. It's the skyline after dark. It's the Empire State. It's the monument to world peace, the UN. And if you become a power broker in Manhattan, you are the man. From an early age, Donald Trump knew there was more than Queens. He felt constricted by uh, his father's world of the outer boroughs. Imagine a young Donald Trump. He leaves this mansion that he lives in with his parents in Jamaica Estates, and every morning makes his way down south along Belt Parkway to Avenue Z in Brooklyn, not far from the waste treatment plant and into the shabby offices of the Trump Organization. He was trying so hard to get away from being the son of a developer from Coney Island, a father who operated out of a very modest, almost trailer-like affair filled with cigar store Indians. Trump hated going to that job. 
He was there to collect rents. He was there to process the paperwork. He was there to check in and keep an eye on the contractors. This was not where he wanted to be. You're a young guy. Right. This is early 70s. You're barely yeah. 30 years old when right. you start this. Younger. Younger. 28. Yeah. What are you thinking? What Are you thinking, I really got to get into Manhattan? I worked in Brooklyn for my father. You know, I, I did very well. I did a lot. But I always wanted to be in Manhattan. My father was a very good builder. Mm -hmm. But he built on his own territory. He felt comfortable in Brooklyn and Queens. He never wanted to enter Manhattan. He didn't think it was his place. For Donald Trump, Manhattan, it's like Oz. He's staring across the East River at Oz, and he wants a piece of that. And he gets a one-room studio, and he moves into Manhattan, he's gonna become a player. It is Cadillac convertible with personalized license plate DJT, and he would go bombing up and down the avenues looking for properties to buy. Thinking, you know, if I could just start small, doing in Manhattan what his father had done in the outer boroughs. Real estate prices were going down, and so it was open territory for a real estate developer who was eager to make his mark. He was generating and grooming this image of himself as a playboy millionaire. And so he would go out to the clubs that were hot at that moment. The club was a place where you would roll up to the bar hoping to meet a model. So you could see that a Donald Trump would be attracted to that kind of a scene. I was one of the very first female members of the club. And it was glamorous and fun, and they played fabulous music. It was the hottest place in town. It had a very intimate dance floor. All the women were chic and well-dressed, and the men were handsome, wearing either suits or tuxedos, and you could really fall in love with anybody in this place. And I remember one night, I went over to the Major D, and I said, who is that man? He said, he's a new member. His name is Donald Trump. I thought he was extremely handsome. He had a way about him that just caught my eye immediately. You went to the club, the, club, right? the, the greatest right. I've ever been to. The level of beauty was, Lake Club to me was the greatest club that I've ever been associated with. In the world? I, I've been to every, I've been everywhere. Trump would hang out there in order to be noticed, but also to get to know the movers and shakers of this new world of Manhattan that he was diving into. Donald very much set his sights on becoming a player in the hierarchy of New York real estate. But before he could make his move in Manhattan, a problem arrived on the doorstep of his father. The Justice Department filed a lawsuit against the Trump Organization alleging that they had discriminated against black and Latin families wanting to live in the buildings that his father had built. This was a big problem that could jeopardize any deal. The 1973 lawsuit alleges rampant discrimination on the part of the Trump Organization. We're not talking about discrimination here and there. We're talking about systemic, structural discrimination. This is the kitchen here. I was contacted and asked to be a tester for the uh, Beach Haven apartments, which were owned by Trump management. There was a sign outside that said apartment for rent. And this articulate, well-dressed black man had applied for the apartment. And the superintendent, he said to the man, uh, I'm sorry, but the apartment is taken. I remember it was a gentleman. And he said, I have none to show because there's nothing vacant right now. Right after I, I left, they sent a white person the super greeted me with open arms like he was just waiting for me. And he handed me the lease, and I just ran. And when I got outside, I met up with the commissioner, and we walked back into the building. 
And at this point, the superintendent, all he could say was, uh, well, uh, I'm just doing what my boss told me to do. You feel outraged. You feel insulted. I'm a young black man who has been to college, who has a job. So you do feel a sense of anger at the fact that society still allows this sort of thing to happen. In 1973, I went out to Trump Village and tried to interview as many people as I could. And we found out that if a person of color did apply to live at Trump Village, they, on their application would be handwritten a big C for colored. Those applications would then be put in a separate pile, and those people would be offered either no apartment or they'd be offered a lesser apartment at a lesser property. The Justice Department comes after Donald Trump and his father, Fred, accusing them of racial discrimination. And everyone around him, including his father, is saying, just settle, Donald. Nobody beats the federal government. As Donald Trump was deciding whether to settle the racial bias case on behalf of the company and his father, he goes into the club. He walks in, and there's a man at the table, and that man is Roy Cohn. The meeting between Roy Cohn and Donald Trump began one of the most important relationships in Trump's life. This fight, I have absolutely total confidence, is going to be one and one completely and totally. To this day, Roy Cohn is one of the most controversial and hated people in America. Mention his name and people will throw things at you. To Donald Trump, Roy Cohn is exactly what his father had called a killer. Donald Trump had two mentors, his dad, who taught him there are killers and losers, and Roy Cohn said, even when you lose, you win. Doesn't matter if it look, you say it's a win when it's a loss. Roy Cohn, as a young man, was chief counsel to Senator Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy was the rabble-rousing senator from Wisconsin who rose to power on a lie. All that Senator McCarthy has been trying to do is expose the communists. The lie was that there were hundreds of people in the government who were communists. It was all fake. Roy helped Senator McCarthy invent things. So out of whole cloth, invent you know, communist conspiracies and communists in the State Department and all that. Roy pushed that through. Are you now, have you ever been a member of the okay, Go ahead. Wait, wait a minute, let me ask you a question. Just, just a minute. minute. You're question. asking me Ask to minute. violate the constitutional now, guarantee just a minute. of the Constitution. It does. Years before Twitter, years before cable news, Roy knew that he could get headlines, he could make allegations, and that would stick. You do good work. But McCarthy and Roy Cohn were driven out of Washington in an utter state of disgrace when they were belittled by Joseph Welch in a beautiful moment of American theater when he said, Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? When Roy came to New York, he played it like a win, and he rose to become one of the most powerful fixers in New York of the 20th century. Roy and Trump met at Le Club, which was, in those days, the place to be. And Donald proceeds to tell him that the U.S. Justice Department is going after the Trump family really hard for discriminating against people in, their, in the housing they own. And everybody's telling Trump, just settle it. Roy is the first one who says to Trump, what are you talking about? Go after the Justice Department, counterattack. You can win this. Roy Cohn was a great lawyer. You talk about a controversial guy. I mean, he was a controversial guy. But if he was your friend, he would fight 
to the death. Did you know his reputation? Yeah, I, I, I did, but his reputation was tough. I needed a tough lawyer, you know. I was dealing with tough people. And Roy was very good. And Roy, for me, did a great job. Donald and Fred Trump, along with Roy Cohen, called a press conference. He did something preposterous, which is they said that they were suing the Justice Department for defamation. Donald says this isn't about racism. I don't want them in there because they're all welfare recipients. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was just a made-up story. He knew it was an effective public statement to make to spin the public debate in a different way. This is all Roy Cohn. It's Roy Cohn who's got Trump at his knee telling him how the world works. Roy understood how to generate news and how the media worked, and he understood the interplay between public events and media coverage. Trump marveled at Cohn's understanding of how to sell an idea, both his legal tactics and the coverage of the matters in which he was involved. I remember the first big argument in court. Roy Cohen speaks uninterrupted for 45 minutes. Donald Trump was very flippant, and one of his comments during one of the breaks was, you know, you don't want to live with them either. Roy assures Donald that they can go into this and win. They don't. They lose, they have to settle with the federal government. The Trump Organization, they say we didn't admit guilt. We didn't say that we did anything wrong. We settled with the Justice Department just to make it go away. To this day, you know, you ask Donald Trump about that, and he says, well, we won that. Of course, that's not true. It was a big victory for the Justice Department. I think that case, you know, to this day is in, in Trump's mind. He hated being accused of discrimination. He hated the idea that the government went after him and his father. And he holds animus towards the government to this day. Standard & Poor's bond rating service said today it is absolutely certain that New York City will default on its debt. President Ford has been against federal help for New York, saying it would establish a costly precedent. Default if you must, but don't expect help from the federal government. People were fleeing the city. And that was when Ford said drop dead, the famous right. article. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like that competitive. I was wanting to come in, and other people were afraid to touch Going it. Going the other way. Everybody gone. was on the sidelines. They were all gone or bust. And, and the city was doing terribly. Crime was through the roof. I didn't think about it, because I was counter to the market. I was very counter to it. I've always been counter to it. The Manhattan that Donald Trump crossed the bridge to fulfill his dreams was a Manhattan in pretty sorry shape. Crime was at record height. People were afraid. Well, the city was near bankruptcy. I wrote the column for the Daily News writing about New York. The attitude in New York was a depressing attitude. It was a feeling that, oh my God, the city is really in danger. In other news, the Penn Central, which has been running in the red for a long time now, decided today to sell off some choice real estate, including 10 blocks in downtown Manhattan. They hope to bring in about a billion dollars in the deal. Penn Central, most people thought of it as two railroad companies, but it was really a land-owning company that happened to have some railroads. Rail yards were on the market. Grand Central was on the market and even hotel companies. It was more or less a fire sale. Donald Trump stumbles upon an announcement in the press that the Commodore Hotel, one of the grand old hotel properties of Manhattan, is sitting there unwanted. So it was a big deal when Donald said he was gonna restore a cruddy hotel on 42nd Street. 
at a time when New Yorkers were reeling, were insecure, were frightened. Here's Donald Trump on the scene, bold, optimistic. He was kind of a rare ray of light in a, in a pretty dark scene. He began to play all the players against each other. To get the property, he went to Penn Central and said, hey, look, I have the agreement of Hyatt, and they're going to make this a Hyatt hotel, so you should give it to me, I'll renovate it. He didn't have the agreement of Hyatt, but he said he did. Then he went to Hyatt and said, hey, I'm the one with the control of the property from Penn Central, which he didn't have. They each bought the story, so now he had both the land and the name Hyatt and their cooperation. Now he needed money. He goes to the bank and says, hey, I've got this tax abatement from the government. He didn't have it at that point, but he persuaded the bank that he did. In the ultimate showman kind of way, he was being part operator, part savvy businessman. Donald Trump came in to see me, and he wanted me to exempt his hotel from real estate taxes, which I had the power to do. But I said no, because I did not believe and do not believe that a Hyatt hotel on 42nd Street would not earn enough money to pay taxes. When I said no, he was extremely unpleasant. Donald got very angry and threatened to have him fired. He told me what to do to myself. I told him, he better get out, or I'd have him arrested. I think he was worried. He needs every little bit of help that he can get. Donald didn't have a lot, but he did have one thing, his father. So he went to his father to help him out. His father was very close to both the governor and to the mayor, and so he had entree when he wanted to put forward this idea of getting a big tax break. And so, thanks to his political connections, he was able to get the support of both the city and the state. The Comptroller's Office has reviewed this item closely and supports the renovation of the Commodore Hotel and reconstruction of the hotel on that site. I'm not sure whether we're making the wisest decision in the world, I know that there is no other decision before us to make. And the mayor feels that this is the best possible proposal that the city could get at this time. Vote aye. Control. Donald Trump, through a complicated series of absolute moxie maneuvers, managed to get a huge huge tax break. It's been a long, hard fight. How do you feel? Well, I'm very happy, and I think the city of New York is going to be very happy. We're going to do something now which is going to be a great stride forward for New York City. Donald Trump is a street fighter, and Donald Trump wants to win. He is the consummate, constant negotiator. People ask me, how come, how is it that you got 40 years of tax abatement? And I'd always say, because I didn't ask for 50 but there was more work to be done. Donald Trump, upon the city's demand, was required to submit the contract that indicated he had permission from the Penn Central Railroad. So Donald said, here's my contract with Penn Central. No one actually looked at the last page to notice it had never been signed. So he moved forward on a project of immense scale guaranteeing the city that he had the legal authority to do it, and he did not have the authority. And nobody noticed. And, no and nobody noticed. noticed. Nobody noticed. They just said, could we see your contract? So I sent them a contract. It was signed by me and nobody else, and nobody ever, nobody said, nobody ever signed the other. All right, if they had said, hey, what, what's going on? Would you have copped to it? Would you have said, boy, you didn't I tell me. I don't know what I would have done. And I went through all of that stuff to get the tax abatements that had right. never been right. given in the history of New York because the city was in trouble, right? Oh, where did you hear that, sir? I got my sources. It's really the model that sets up everything that follows. The idea of playing one player against the other. A fair bit of hucksterism mixed with some business savvy to create the buzz, the PR. All of that sense of Trump as a force comes out of the Hyatt deal. Amid a lot of fanfare, the Grand Hyatt held its grand opening today. The mayor and the governor of New York were among those on hand for the ribbon counting. Hyatt Regency is 
now an architectural gem for all the world to see. Hyatt is a fantastic outfit, and all of this is going to combine to make probably the most successful hotel one of them in the country, we feel. It was fabulous. He did it fast, and he did it efficient. It really gave him a sense of pride and a sense that he knew exactly what he was doing. The Commodore was a stepping stone to the Trump Tower. A friend of mine in the real estate industry said, you have the greatest ability to get great locations of any human being I've ever seen. It's true. No matter what it is, if you look at any of my projects, I have the best locations. One day, so the story goes, Donald is looking for an ideal location to put up what would become a signature project. He's crisscrossing Manhattan in his car, looking for that ideal situation. Suddenly reaching the corner of Fifth Avenue and 56th Street and noticing the Bonwit Teller building, an old Art Deco 10-story department store. Here is the opportunity Donald is looking for, and it is at that corner that he decides, this is where I'm going to stake my future. The finest piece of real estate, considered to be the finest piece of real estate in the world, is at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th Street. That's the Tiffany corner of the world. The New York Times is reporting that Bonwitz is being sold to Donald Trump and that the store could be closed by July. Bonwit gives him a six-month, $25 million option to purchase the property. He was constantly borrowing money from his father during this period, and he had to get a partner, Equitable Bank, because he can't do this alone. He just doesn't have the money to build his signature tower. So now he's got a mortgage, the interest clock is ticking. He's got a partner that's taking the bulk of the profits. He needs every little bit of help that he thinks he can get. So he, again, latched on to tax breaks. Donald Trump now faces the biggest skirmish in his battle to build Trump Tower. He's going to come into conflict with the mayor of New York City. The positions that I take are not ideological. They are reasonable, they are sensible, and that's why people support me. Look, Ed Koch was a totally overrated mayor. He was a Ed bad guy. Hey, hey, look, Ed, and you can quote me. Right. Ed Koch was a bad guy. Oh. He was a total bully. All Ed Koch was concerned about was press. In other words, he wanted to make sure he looked good. Ed, go fuck yourself. You're a piece of shit. Uh, that uh, have particular duties. The city and then, was uh, offering tax breaks to developers but they were not thinking that this is the kind of tax break they would give away for luxury apartments. This was a program that would be used to turn a vacant lot into an apartment building for the middle class. But here comes this application from Donald Trump, and the city turns him down. He's outraged. Trump sues the city, so now he's at loggerheads with the Koch administration. And that potentially meant a long battle that could go on for years. One of the beneficiaries of the abatements is real estate developer Donald Trump. I was entitled to that abatement, and I am by law entitled to that abatement. Councilman Henry Stern and Councilman Robert Wagner Jr. opposed it as an excessive gift of public funds. I did a weekly show between Ruth Messenger, who's a city council member, who was very much against giving any tax breaks to businessmen, particularly businessmen like him, Donald Trump. And Trump believed in tax breaks, particularly for him. The program has become a corporate welfare program. I really think before you make those statements on the air that you should go back and check your facts and figures. Donald, the statute says very specifically that in order to qualify, the site on which the residential building is going up is either vacant predominantly vacant or underutilized. You don't the think a 10-story building is an underutilization when I'm building a 68-story building? Absolutely not. Oh, you, I see. Okay. Correct. Okay. Tell me about it. They had the grand time between these two 
it was a night flight. Ruth, I'd like to interrupt. We denied a benefit. This is ridiculous. To listen to this. I mean, look, at the end of the day, there's a toughness to him. I mean, this is a very tough guy. I mean, he can take a lot of bullets. He can catch bullets in his teeth. He can eat broken glass. A punchback sort of a person with a armadillo skin. This is just so ridiculous. You've asked me onto a program I'm supposed to be, and I listen to this that... It's a calling card. Attack the person personally. Don't give them a quarter. Don't be nice. Don't be reasonable. Attack them. You have to destroy them because they're going to destroy you. If you spent the same time trying to clean up our subways and clean up the city of crime, I well, I don't know that you do. If you do, you're certainly doing a very ineffective job. Sound familiar? When Trump finally got all the permissions he needed, ready to roll on the construction of Trump Tower, his pride and joy. He needed to get someone who actually knows how to build a building. Donald and I sort of worked together while I was working on the Hyatt. I was at a fundraiser with my husband, and he said to my husband, uh, I'm going to hire her. She's going to work for me. I'm going to double her salary. <laughs> and that's how I learned about Trump Tower. She was the first woman to run the construction of a major skyscraper. Trump was always proud of the fact that he put a woman in that position and entrusted her with this project from beginning to end. Bob Arrest had a very tough job. It was a culture of macho men. A lot of these guys are chauvinistic pigs, you know, to be quite honest. There were no women in the construction industry. You could count them on one hand, even if you lost a few fingers. He said something to me. He said, men are better than women. But a good woman is better than 10 good men. And he meant that as a compliment. <laughs> Donald trusted me implicitly. And he respected people that told him things the way they were. And it was not easy to do that, because when you stood up to him, you got, you got hammered. He said to me, you know, you're a killer. And <laughs> I later learned that his father actually used that expression with him, that people should be killers. I thought and I quickly confirmed that he was very inexperienced. He really didn't know much about construction at all. But I thought that he was intelligent. You didn't have to tell him a hundred times. And with him, that was a good thing because he could only listen once if you were lucky and you got him to listen to all the story. Once the project got the green light, Donald Trump confronted the next problem, which was how do we take down this 10-story department store? Most famously, that building had this facade of gorgeous sculptures that were the hallmark of Von Witt Teller, one of the most prized architectural features on Fifth Avenue. These stone relief sculptures at the top of the building were very stylized, very naked dancers with long scarves. Trump made a deal to remove this piece of art carefully from the facade of the building and give it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this would be a compromise. The, the great landmark art would be saved, and Trump would be able to go ahead and demolish the building. In order to get the demolition done cheaply, Donald Trump, as he often did, found the lowest bidding company he could. He hired a Polish demolition company, which turned out to employ immigrants who were undocumented. They were being paid essentially less than $5 an hour when they got cash. Some of them said they were being paid in vodka. They did the work 12 to 18 hour days. And it's dangerous, dirty work. You're dismantling concrete, debris falling down on you. They had nowhere to live. They were sleeping on the floor of the Bonwit Teller store at night. And all of this was done at breakneck pace. And then one afternoon, one of the directors of the Metropolitan Museum of Art gets a call in her office, and she's told, Donald Trump is destroying the freeze. I got into a taxi, got into a classic New York City traffic jam. I was nine months pregnant at the time. But I got out of the cab and I ran for 10 blocks. I'll never forget that run. Got down 56th Street.
and we watch them being jackhammered. I was furious. <laughs> The Trump Organization could have asked the Met for help in taking the pieces down and removing them. And they didn't. You were recently the object of a lot of controversy because you ordered destroyed some sculptures on the a building that you bought that the Metropolitan Art Museum wanted. Why did you have those destroyed, first of all, and what happens to the look of a city? As an art building or an art deco building, it really was not worth very much and we did take it down and there was somewhat of an outcry but I think that's generally subsided. He gets a bunch of bad publicity but in his mind it's all good publicity because here he's seen as this force of progress, this guy who's bullying his way through all this red tape and all these fussy artist types in order to get his building built and to get the commerce of New York moving again. Very carefully, Donald is putting all the pieces in place for this signature project. But he's also borrowing money all over the place. While he often portrays himself as sort of a self-made man, the only money he had is what he borrowed from his father. Fred Trump was nervous. He was co-signing all the loans. He was the one, it was his money. Fred Trump was involved in the Trump Tower project. That's how I met him. I remember he was, he didn't like me. I mean, let's put it this way, he hated me. He hated the very notion that a woman would be working in construction to begin with, and much less be in charge of a project that was his son's project. So uh, we were like, <sighs> he would say, oh no, that's all wrong. You don't know what you're doing. But I went to Donald, I said, you, you've got to get your father off my back. He's driving me crazy. And he, he said to me, suck it up, baby, in so many words because, you know, he was putting up with them, too. Most buildings, by the time that Trump Tower was built, were using steel to put structures up. And what was unusual about Trump Tower was that it was largely built out of concrete. And what we were doing was what's called a fast track, which is you build it before it's completely designed. And it was a concrete building, which was great because you design it one day and you can pour it the next day. Most of the contracting in the construction industry in New York was controlled to a large extent by the mob, specifically the concrete business. Business that you could call Mafia Inc. They are said to run the most powerful crime families in New York. Federal investigators say the mob controls the concrete workers in the construction industry. My name is Michael Francis, and uh, you can call me Michael. That's fine. And how do you credential yourself? You know, former cop regime in the Colombo crime family is a, a normal moniker for me, and um, I guess for this purpose is probably the best way to address it. Basically, the mob controlled all the concrete business in the city of New York. Because Trump Tower was a concrete building, you know, it was a big score for us guys. You know, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that, you know, Trump was in bed with the mob. I'm not saying that he was one of our guys. But he certainly had a deal with us. I mean, he didn't have a choice. So in that regard, he did. In 1982, there was a major stoppage among all the concrete providers. Everybody's worried a lot of developers are in a bind now. There's a delay in their construction. When it occurred, we were in the process of pouring concrete to get the main structure up. And every day that you lose that goes by is a day delayed, and uh, it costs money for Donald. They're not going to beat us. I mean, we can hold out as long as we want to hold out. So, you know, eventually they have to come around. John Cody was a union boss who lived on the dividing line between the union and the mob. Cody was a guy who could make things go well for you, or he could make things go poorly for you. It's an interesting question as to why, when every other developer in New York can't get access to concrete, Donald Trump is still able to just move along swimmingly. One of the things that Cody was able to do for Trump was make sure that drivers continue to deliver concrete to the site. 
You have to be able to deal with many different things to be able to be a successful developer. Right. You have to be able to deal with the unions. And concrete guys who are mobbed up. And you have to get, you get along with these people. You had no choice. There was nobody else to do it. Trump struck a deal with John Cody. And Mr. Cody was able to get an apartment for his mistress in Trump Tower. She was given a very prominent apartment on a high floor of Trump Tower, and she had one demand, and that was she wanted a swimming pool in her apartment. Trump Tower did not come with a swimming pool. So Trump went in and had that part of the building reinforced so that it could hold the weight of a swimming pool and all the water in it. This is the world Trump operated in. And shortly before Trump Tower was finished, Cody was convicted of racketeering and sent to prison. I don't like getting close to people like that. But they respected me. And a lot of this is relationships. It's a lot of it's really, well, a lot of life is relationship. A lot of what I've done is relationship. A lot of great things that have happened to me happened to me because of relationship. Millionaire real estate developer Donald Trump will get a handsome tax break for his latest project on Fifth Avenue. In the case of Trump Tower, he engaged the city in a big battle over getting this deal. And in the end, there was a fair umpire in the Court of Appeals of New York State, and he won fair and square and got his tax abatement. Well, here we are on the top of the Trump Towers. Today is the topping off of this fabulous building. When they finally finished the Trump Tower, Donald took the opportunity to have a topping off party. But this is the greatest skyline in the world, so this is a great addition to New York skyline. What do you think about the view? It's pretty nice from up here, isn't it? I've always wanted to look down on General Motors. And I'm <laughs> it was quite exciting being on the top of the building when they finished it off, put the last cornerstone in, and everybody was there with balloons, and it was quite a fanfare. Trump Tower was the biggest moment in Donald's life. Eight years ago, I must say I was embarrassed to say I was in the real estate business in New York. Today, I can honestly say I'm proud of it, and it's the number one city in the world. And I say a large part of that is due to the tremendous abilities of Mayor Koch. I think he's done a tremendous job. Thank you very much. You know, all the media were there covering this, and um, it kind of gave a speech which was so funny because they hated each other. And may the windows of this building forever look out upon a place of peace and prosperity. Very nice, thank you. Very, Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Mr. Trump, what are your sentiments today regarding the whole uh, celebration? Very happy here? day. The, com the completion of the tallest concrete building mm -hmm. in the city of New York. How are the sales going? Well, I have nothing to do with sales, but they, I hear they're going excellent, fantastic, unbelievable. I think Fred Trump was authentically proud of Donald's early successes in New York. He was amazed that his little boy had graduated from Queens into a premier address in Manhattan and was able to build a landmark tower with the family name on it. I remember we were going up to New York on spring break, and I asked my son what he wanted to do in New York, what he wanted to see. And he said, most of all, he wanted to go see the lobby of Trump Tower. And sure enough, we did it, and we were all pretty impressed. I remember walking in and looking up and seeing this escalator and seeing the fountains and feeling that I was, you know, as an outsider, as a, as a Brit, that this was the apotheosis of big, glitzy, you know, vulgar, if you like, Americana, and I loved it. Because, you know, that's what was fun about America. It was kind of the Liberace of buildings, really, if you like. <laughs> Here is Donald being lauded for this great achievement, but obviously absent from the celebration is Donald's elder brother, Fred Jr. As a pilot, Fred Jr. continues to struggle with what, in retrospect, will be seen as a lifelong battle with alcohol. And he falls out of grace with the airlines and cannot function as a pilot anymore. 
By this time in his life, it's been communicated by his father and by his brother that they don't expect much from him. He winds up moving home and into the family mansion and is essentially a handyman for the Trump properties. Ordered about by his father, asked to do menial tasks. He was intended to be heir to the throne of the Trump organization. But from this point on, he really did start to spiral downward more rapidly. Fred was a great guy, but you know, he had an alcohol yeah. problem, okay? And he was such an amazing guy. And the best personality, best looking guy you'll ever see. And you know, he had a lot of things, but he had an alcohol problem. I never really thought of his having a problem with drinking, really until the last time I saw him. And that was in the hospital of Manhattan. He kept saying, I've got to get off the sauce. I've got to get off the sauce. His passing is the first real loss in Donald's life. But Donald viewed Fred Jr.'s death as an example of weakness of what happens when you're not tough enough, when you don't fight, when you don't strike back. It's just a fact of life that some people win and some people lose, and they may be brothers, but they're still winners and losers. What his father taught him, that he was a killer, turned out to be true. Donald Trump had made all of this happen. He was not yet 40 years old, and he was a force to be reckoned with on the island of Manhattan. There was no greater proof that could be offered by life of the excellence of the Trump method and the superiority of his own talents than the completion of this grand project. By the way, uh, he is a chip off the old block. <laughs> this my, is- uh, My father, uh, Fred. Right. You were gonna say something about your dad. You said he was very difficult to work with. Number one, he was a very tough man. But he was also a, a man that would never let anything go. He was a very strong man. He was a very detail-oriented person. But it did great deals for him. In fact, he gave a statement to Business Week magazine many, many years ago. Everything Donald touches turns to gold. Donald Trump was never a man who was dying to settle down. He took us to a hotel. And next day, I got three dozens of the roses. Try and blow all the candles out with one breath, okay? You want to hold it? The name Marla Maples came up shortly after that. No guy likes talking about affairs, by the way. <laughs> it had sex, it had beauty, it had bazillions of bucks. It had everything. The attention he got in the media actually made him feel a lot. Well, there's a lot of coverage in it. And gradually, of course, things got out of control. He was frightened. Trump was staring at destroying not only his own legacy, but his father's legacy as well. But you have said that if you ran for president, you'd win. I think I'd have a very good chance. I mean, I like to win. He's one of the greatest shows on earth. You don't know what he's going to do next, and you can't stop watching.